Hello everybody and welcome to Nerdly Out Loud, the officially unofficial podcast of nerdly.co.uk. I say, uh, I say officially unofficial, I just I just like the term, but we're pretty much official. Uh, big man on campus, editor-in-chief Phil Wheat, has sanctioned me to do this, and he is giving me his baby to to run with the podcast and see how it gets on. Um, so that is what we're doing here. My name is Kevin Haldon, uh, or Kevin, or Kev, or whatever you want to call me. You can just call me the annoying guy behind the microphone if you want. That's all cool. Uh, I do a, another podcast called the 365 Flicks Podcast, which is on Nerdly. He houses our podcast, and it's a fantastic place to be. We love being there. The community is awesome. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But we just love being there, and we will do anything for Phil, which is why... I was kind of trying to figure out what else I could do on the website. What I, I put my reviews out there. We put our podcasts on there. But I was kind of like, what else can I do? And I was like, well, you know what? I'm a podcaster. I podcast. I, I speak into a microphone. That's what I do. Uh, geeky, nerdy shit. That is what I'm all about. So why not do a nerdly out loud um, podcast? And if you're wondering what the out loud bit is, it is exactly what it is. Like When you go to the website, you read the reviews on this i'm going to read the reviews to you but what i'm going to try and do is there's going to be a main featured interview on on all the episodes hopefully i uh, hope on hope we get, get um some some good guys coming forward to to jump on so we're going to do that so i'm going to be reading the reviews that are put out there by the contributors myself included and giving hopefully i'll have seen most of the movies i'll try and cherry pick the ones i have seen and i'll pick some that i haven't seen and i'll give sort of my my interpretation of 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 what i thought of the movie i'm not going to rip apart people's reviews that's not what i'm about because they are the contributors on the website and we love these guys but I'm just gonna like I'll just drop a nugget in here and there. So like if I've um, if, if if I have an opinion on something, I'm, I'll drop it in, and I'm pretty sure we'll get some interesting interesting stuff going. And what I'm what I'm gonna try and do is going forward with the podcast if it carries on, which I I feel it might. But what I'll try and do is the guys who are writing the reviews, I will try and get them to record themselves reading it. So we get like some different voices or even get them on the show and we'll go through their reviews. Like it could, it could be something we could do that way. A big old community smorgasbord, but a little bit about nerdly.uk, uh, nerdly.co.uk before we get into it. Or as we like to say, nerdly, we are nerdly, are you? That's kind of the tagline of the website. We love it. So uh, Nerdly is the UK home for all your pop culture needs, from cool videos to awesome artwork, news on fantastic events, plus a whole heap of reviews. We cover the best in pop culture, be it comics, movies, TV, DVD, Blu-ray, technology, toys, apps, and video games. If it's Nerdly, we've got it covered. As you can tell, I'm reading this from the website. Thank you very much, Phil, for sending that over, because I am terrible when I go off script. We pride ourselves on fresh content we, we bring you um never before seen content each and every day we strive to deliver five pieces of original content a day at least i mean i've seen him go hammer and tong and just drop a whole bunch of shit in one day so, so you're gonna get more than that you're definitely gonna get more than that um be they reviews podcasts or features which is like your interviews and whatnot and that's on top of the usual pop culture news cycle, something we pride ourselves on, something which cannot be said of most of our competitors. Oh, shots fired, Phil. I love that. With the diverse staff, because like I said earlier, we, we've got contributors, loads of people writing on this website. We've got people covering games and whatnot. It's, it's a fantastic little place to go and get your geek on, basically. So uh, we have a, a diverse staff. We aim to cover the widest possible range of topics with writers focusing on their specialist areas, wrestling, movies, horror, comics, video games, all backed by a wealth of geeky experience. We also look to help out the little guy. Now, this is why I love Nerdly. It's why I'm part of Nerdly, because I'm very much a fan of the independents. Yeah, I'll go to the cinema and I'll watch the big budget Hollywood blockbusters, and I do love them. I love me some Marvel. I love me some DC. I love me all of that, that stuff. But um, what I'm really, where my heart lies, and what I really love is the the smaller guy, the the independent guy, the the director on his way up, the actors on the way up, the producers who are helping the directors and the actors on the way up. That's where my heart lies. That's where I live. It's where I want to be, and I'm very, very happy in that space. These guys have all got something to say. They're all churning out. I mean, the British movie scene right now 
is just electric. Obviously, when I say right now, I mean in general, because right now, COVID, coronavirus, it's a little bit crap, which is horrible, but that's all happening. And But when we come out of it, the the just the movie scene in, in the UK is just insane right now we've got some amazing stuff happening and and we're going to cover all of that as we go through these podcast episodes and we'll get some of these guys on um and i know a lot of these guys who are, are making a way and and paving paving stones made of gold are in their future so we're going to be doing that so yeah um all backed by a wealth of geeky experience, we also like to help out the little guy, giving special attention to independent movies and direct to DVD, VOD, movies, comics, and apps, as well as promoting crowdfunding campaigns through our monthly back this column. Yes, I love that as well. We we cover a lot of Kickstarter things. Phil has helped me push some of the Kickstarter guys that we love, so that's all been awesome. Um, check out those articles as well. So we're not the only ones producing our own content. We've teamed up with a variety of content producers. I keep saying we, it's Phil's baby, it's not mine. I'm just stealing it for the podcast. Uh, Teamed up with a variety of content producers who have all chosen to make Nerdly their second home, including the history of bad ideas. Love these guys. We went over to Cincinnati to meet them. Um, Cincinnati, America, by the way, that was that was a trip. Um, Jason, Jeff, Blake, awesome guys. A geek podcast covering all aspects of geekdom. Then there's Three Six Five Flicks podcast, which is my other podcast. Um, this episode of Nerdly Out Loud will actually be on that feed. We are going to be pushing it into its own thing. Um, depending on how well it goes and, and how, how how much we like what we've done here. Uh, 365 Flex, a nerdy podcast, putting the movie and TV world on trial. Yeah, we it's basically me and Chris, my, my co-host Chris and best friend Chris Richardson. Um, it's just us sitting, shooting the breeze and just tearing things apart or gushing over them either. Right? It's, it's up to you. Pop Addled, a pop culture podcast with nerd tendencies, of course. Cinema Geeks, a weekly film podcast featuring actors, new films, trailers, and more. I love Cinema Geeks. Please do check them out. Talking in Circles, a pop culture talk show where the host wax poetic about comic books, movies, TV, and anything geek culture. You see a theme? Comic Trips, a never-ending search for all things nostalgia-related, from comic books to toys, movie memorabilia, to long-forgotten pieces of pop culture history. So there's definitely a theme there. Now, we also have, um, it's not in this little blurb here, but you can find it on the main page. We also have the Filmmakers podcast, hosted by the wonderful Giles Alderson. He is a filmmaker himself. His podcast is where he sits down with actors, directors, producers, studio heads, um, sound guys, editors anybody who's involved in the filmmaking progress uh, process but the best thing is is that f- f- uh, that giles is also involved in the filmmaking process he is a director himself um, i will review one of his movies later on in this show uh, arthur and merlin the, the guy is doing what he loves but he's also podcasting about doing what he loves which is awesome i, I love listening to filmmakers we we kind of do it with um with 365 and we're going to be doing it with Nerdly Out Loud. But it's sort of like, we're just fans. We're, I'm, I'm just a fan. I want to talk to them on a fan level about the movies they've made and loved and their experiences on it. But um, Giles goes in deep on how it was made and how he got it done and how not to, in his humble opinion, F it up. So, yeah, that's that's awesome. Uh, Filmmakers Podcast, check them out. We have reviews for everything you can think of. We're the big budget, the low budget, the no budget. The, the just got reviews for everything. Interviews with all these guys that are doing it. Just fantastic guys. I'll be covering a lot of these things. You'll be hearing about more guys who are contributors on the site, who do the interviews. You'll be hearing about all these different things as we go. I want to include everything about Nerdly on Nerdly Out Loud. So, yeah, but if you've got a product or a service that you would like us to have a look at, or you would like Phil, sorry, sorry, Phil, I'm stealing your thunder. If you would like Phil, to have a look at please do that get in touch with them and be, become part of the team become part of the team who knows you might even end up on the podcast probably will because i can see me um farming some of this stuff out to people <laughs> but yeah that's nerdly.co.uk you can find that's exactly where you find the website 
please do go and have a look and um, jump on read some of the reviews but also go to the social medias and um, the facebook the twitter the instagram whichever ones he's on he's on all of them i, I believe uh, nerdly and um, please do go and find them and give us a like give us a share give us a subscribe do all that good stuff and let people know where you found us and let them know about this new podcast which is going to be awesome and i haven't even spoken about the main feature of this episode now, you will see from the strap line, from the title, that it is an interview with Jesse Johnson, a director of many Scott Adkins films and his own career, like long before that as well. Um, back in the day, he got on board with the likes of uh, As a Stunt Guy, Total Recall. He's worked with some absolutely phenomenal directors, some of the biggest names. You're going to hear about all that. Um, but recently, in the last three or four years, he's done movies with Scott Adkins like Savage Dog, um, Avengement, Debt collectors, triple threat, um, just some some absolutely phenomenal movies that I have just been so in love with for the last few years. Accident Man as well, and then um, getting him on the show when I reached when I when I reached out to him to try and get him on, I thought he's not going to answer, and he totally answered. Just I guess that's the the good thing about the coronavirus and the lockdown is that people want to talk to us. So um, I, I got him on the phone. We had like a really, really good long in depth chat. I've, I've edited it down to, to the bare bolts. But I, I think you're going to love the interview. The interview will be coming a little bit later on. I'm going to, because the, the, the other half of this podcast is going to be exactly like I said, I'm going to be reading out the reviews that are on the website and um, giving my little nuggets of thoughts on, on what, what is going on with them. And if I've seen the movie, I'm going to drop it in there. And yeah, we're going to roll like that there'll be more to it i'm going to bring more into the podcast i'm going to bring a lot to it uh, hopefully we'll we'll be able to throw a lot more at you but for the most part that's what, what the theme of the thing is going to be so on this episode because i had jesse johnson on to talk i decided to kind of stick to the action genre so the reviews you're going to be hearing me me read out and give them um, little bits and pieces of they are going to be kind of based around that genre and then we'll get into the interview proper you're going to love the interview please stick around for it it's absolutely phenomenal jesse gives us so many little pearls of wisdom and and hearing about his journey is just phenomenal but we'll get into that in a little bit and then we'll drop some reviews so yeah, let's uh, let's let's get into the meat and potato of what this uh, meat and potatoes of what this episode is all about and what Nerdly Out Loud is going to be. Let's uh, let's get on with some reviews. This is Litvak. This is Litvak. It won't let you leave. Been in lockdown for a long time, and we're, we're slowly coming out of it. But um, movies haven't really been at the cinemas. But this movie, I believe, uh, I could be, I could be wrong. I could be wrong. Um, but this movie, I believe, The Vigil is one of the first movies to actually be getting played in the theaters, which is awesome. Uh, stars Dave Davis, uh, Fred Melamed, um, Ronald Cohen, Lynn Cohen. And it is written and directed by Keith Thomas, which is, um, from what I'm told, is a debut. It's a director's debut. I haven't personally seen this, so I won't be able to jump in and give too much of, a, of an input, but we'll go through and we'll see what we think. So this article was brought to us from Matthew Turner, one of the contributors on Nerdly. And yeah, let's see what he's got to say about this film. So a little bit of a blurb and then we'll get into it. The debut feature from writer-director Keith Thomas. I'm going to try and read these quite, um, you know, in a world. I'll probably hurt my throat if I do that, though, so I'll not do it too much. So the debut feature from writer-director Keith Thomas. Engaging and atmospheric horror The Vigil centres on Yaakov Ronan, played by Dave Davis, a young man who has recently joined a self-help group for Jews struggling to adjust after leaving a tight-knit Orthodox community. In addition to processing a deeply traumatic event, Yaakov is also struggling financially. So when his former rabbi, Seb Shalom, offers him $400 to sit as a shoma and watch over the body of a recently deceased Holocaust survivor, he is more or less forced to accept. 
but um, we're, 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 we're going in on this one, aren't we? Um, that's the kind of movie we've got, so we've set the scene. As the vigil explains up front with captions, being a shoma means protecting the recently deceased person from evil spirits or demons. Unfortunately, Mr. Litvak had spent most of his life being haunted by a mazist, similar to a debug. I mean, you can put that in brackets. I still don't know what it is. But so ya Yakov finds, I keep say, I keep meaning to say Yakov, but Yakov finds he has his work cut out as malicious demon attempts to find a new host. The only other person in the house is Mrs. Litvak, played by Lincoln, whose severe dementia occasionally yields either useful advice or a timely warning. In what could very well prove a breakthrough performance, Davis is terrific as Yakov, engaging the audience's sympathy with heartfelt turn that shows just how vulnerable and lost the young man is after his own recent tragedy. There's also strong support from Lynn Cohen, who's also good for, good for a jump scare or two, while Lustig is effective as the rabbi who may know more than he's letting on. Of course he does. Thomas's direction is impressive throughout, especially when it comes to establishing a deeply creepy atmosphere. The lighting is particularly creative with Zach Copperstein's camera work expertly ratcheting up tension by forcing you to peer into darkness or scan held images for hints of movement. Oh, I love when movies do that. You know when you're like you find yourself sitting there and you're literally just looking at a curtain or a window and you're you're surveying the screen, your your eyes are everywhere like what's gonna jump out on me, what's what's gonna happen here and um you start to see things sometimes but it's uh, th those are sometimes th some of the best movies. So on top of that, Thomas's script finds clever ways around the usual why doesn't he just leave the problem? First, by establishing via a phone call to his therapist that Yakov has already been seeing and hearing things anyway, so the entire film can be read as his mental breakdown. Oh, I like that. And second by, well, that bit is too good to spoil here, but it gives the film one of its strongest horror scenes was a tease. In addition to deploying some decent jump scares, Thomas pulls off a wide variety of creepy moments, the best of which find inventive uses for a mobile phone. It's a nice touch that Yakov is already daunted by his phone and he's only just got one for the first time. Thomas's depiction of the Mazak itself is equally impressive, most notably in the withholding of the demon's face until the crucial moment. So I'm gonna I'm gonna assume that the Mazak is the, the demon. Still don't know what one is. The Vigil does an excellent job of dovetailing the horror elements with a gripping character portrait of a man undergoing a dark night of the soul. As such, this is an accomplished debut from Thomas, and it will be fascinating to see what he does next four out of five wow awesome um that actually does sound really cool like I, I like a good horror movie i'm a big fan of the conjurings i uh, love those films um one of the, this might be one that i check out when i'm just kind of perusing something to watch you know sometimes you get on a right horror kick and you go looking for something that yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna check that one out thank you of course to matthew turner who wrote that review for nerdly um big shout out to him i couldn't really throw much into that but um i do love a good horror and that sounds like a fantastic one so he gave it four out of five the vigil was re is released in the uk on july the 31st so it's it's still come out um but it's going to be from what i'm from what I gather, it's going to be one of the first ones to hit the cinema, which is amazing. Like, I can't wait to get back to the cinema. So, yeah, the, um, the Vigil. Look out for that one. Um, sounds pretty dope. Um, I'll be interested to, to check that one out. Dude, these three bigs were in, we're out. What do you say? Are you serious? Yeah, really? Yeah. What is this? It's called a car, mate. No, it's a wheelchair with a roof wrenching. It's clean, it's quiet, and it doesn't smell like your ass on the inside. All right. Where are we off to first, then? Las Vegas. Is that okay with you? Follow me. Does the English shoe salesman know who he's talking to? We're not here to push foot around, so you've already prepared the reddies. Let's have it. Give the bag to Mr. French. <laughs> So as I've mentioned, the interview with Jesse Johnson is coming up um, shortly. But first of all, I would be very, very remiss not to at least bring you one of the reviews that have been done on Nerdly for one of his movies. And we're going to go with um, Payback, which is also known as The Debt Collectors. When we talk about it in the interview, it's, it's we keep calling it Debt Collectors because that's effectively what it was called over in America, I think over in, in the UK. It is called Payback. 
uh, stars Scott Adkins, uh, Louis Mandalo, Marina Sirtis, TNG, TNG. Yep, she's she is in this movie. Um, awesome to see her. Uh, written by Jesse V. Johnson and Stu Small, directed by Jesse Johnson. So I have seen this, so I'm going to be able to chip in. And I got some, there's some fantastic insight in the um, the interview about the movie. And I can't wait for you to, to actually hear that. It, well, don't worry, we will be getting there soon. I'm just nerdly out loud. We're going we're gonna to read some reviews out loud. It does what it says on the tin. So this is what uh, Phil had to say. Phil Wheat, the editor-in-chief, is back with uh, Payback, or The Debt Collector. A direct sequel to 2018's The Debt Collector, renamed Payback for the UK market. No doubt so the distributor doesn't give any publicity to their competition, which we actually talk about in the interview. It's quite funny that Phil's written that. Yeah, you, you realise why it's called something different, and um, yeah, Jesse will tell us about that. The film sees debt collectors, French and Sue, back doing what they do best as they chase down various debts and debtors who owe money to their boss, Tommy. They're summoned to Las Vegas to collect from a dirty casino owner who happens to be a vicious ex-lover of Sue's. Meanwhile, a notorious drug kingpin is on the warpath to kill French and Sue to avenge his brother's death. Facing danger from all angles, the pair will have no other choice but to fight their way out of an explosively dangerous situation. That's what it says on the tin. It's fantastic. Um, I'm going to be honest, I missed The Debt Collector when it was originally released. Now, I did buy the film on iTunes, but to this day, I still haven't gotten around to watching it. Phil, what are you doing? Get it watched. Which gave me some concern, given that Payback is, even with the UK retitle, a direct sequel to that film. Luckily for me and the distributors of this film, you don't necessarily have to see The Debt Collector to enjoy this one. Plot points are referenced, yes, but nothing that's so integral that you're missing out by not watching the first movie. Now, yeah, 100%. Uh, I, I have seen both movies, but no, you don't have to have seen the original to, to get this one. Yes, okay, it might be a little bit um, jarring at first because these two guys know each other and they seem to have a history that you don't know about. But come on, how many films out there have done that where you don't quite know the full history of what's going on? So 100%, you don't have to have seen the first one. A throwback to the buddy cop films of the 90s, though these guys are far from being an authority figures, Payback is an action comedy that blends the two genres perfectly, finding the balance between the hard-hitting action we've come to expect from Scott Adkins uh, slash Jesse Johnson collaboration and proving just enough laughs, particularly from Adkins, who seems to have been given a new acting freedom by using his own accent and not trying to hide Scott Adkins. I like that. I actually, yeah, I really like that. That's that's really cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that was kind of, yeah, nice one, Phil. I, I really like that. His, his, uh, he has superb chemistry with Louis, uh, Louis Mandalore, someone who I've loved since back in the days of martial law and Channel 5 in the late 90s. We all loved that. Which goes a long way to building a rapport with the audience too, especially given that their characters are somewhat shady, yet we still need to root for them as underdogs. 100%. I say in the interview, um, the, the chemistry between these two guys, you'd think they'd like made about a million movies together. They're just so good together. Like uh, Louis Mandalore is kind of this... I, I kind of referred to him or I kind of talk about him as a sort of an old school, uh, traditional kind of Hollywood leading man. He just oozes charisma on the screen and he just looks so good, you know, like when Mickey Rock kind of started out or when, or even when he started coming back and, and, and getting, getting himself back into the main, it just... Louis Mandelor reminds me of that kind of leading man that you just knew could um, handle himself, kick the shell with people. Um, and although in this movie, yeah, no spoilers, but he's a little adverse to that. Um, but you really got it. Like he, he's he's just such a fantastic um, actor, and, and the character of Sue is so cool. But then you throw him in with Scott Adkins, who's just so cool and so British, and so like even has a bit where he's on about King George, hey, come and have a go, he's like let's have yeah, and all that kind of thing. And uh, Scott is just wonderful in this film, and the two of them they do they work so well together and. I, th I believe from sort of avengement onwards, we're seeing sort of a different side to Scott Adkins. Yeah, we know he can kick the shit out of people. We know he's fantastic on a roundhouse. We know his martial art technique is second to none. We know he's just this awesome, awesome, like, British guy. 
but in this movie and and, and Avengement onwards, he's he's bringing sort of like a little bit of cheek to things, and he's he's kind of just a little bit of comedy's coming out of him, and and maybe that's just because in this day and age and and, and this this era that we're in, you can't just be good at kicking the shit out of people. You need to have some chops about you. You need to have some a acting ability, but from the most part, you have to have a bit of comedy about you as well. So uh, Atkins is going the right way on that, and and these two are wonderful together. They're wonderful together. Packed with plenty of fight sequences. Uh, by the way, the fight sequence in the um, the alleyway, which we talk about in the interview, but um, the, that fight sequence, watch out for that because it is so good. Yeah, these two guys, damn, they 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 nail this. Uh, Payback or the debt collectors is not going to disappoint and. Uh, any action movie fans and as such as a solid recommendation from me the film is out now on digital from Dazzler Media Phil where's the rain you didn't give a rain there's no rain here Phil yeah that's that's all cool but um obviously Phil enjoyed the movie um it does harken back a little bit to sort of those 90s uh, 90s 80s movies um but not not so much in the way that it gets cheesy or anything like that the the soundtrack I want to give a shout out to the soundtrack because it is absolutely wonderful um yeah the debt collector or payback or whatever you want to call it it's payback over here is a fantastic film the the two leads wonderful Jesse Johnson did a, a wonderful job with this, and of course Marina Sirtis from The Next Generation. Just fantastic to see her on the screen again, so that was all good. Please do check that one out, it's out now, and we love it here at Nerdly. And now, our feature presentation. We are joined by Jesse Johnson, who's been in the film industry for a great number of years, uh, starting back in 1990, working on the stunts team for Total Recall. Everybody remembers that film. Steadily making a name for himself as a stunts performer and coordinator, working on movies like uh, Starship Troopers, Charlie's Angels, uh, Lincoln... Uh, Jesse would then move into directing his own projects with varying levels of success until he struck gold with the pairing up with uh, fellow Brit martial artist Scott Adkins uh, in 2017's Savage Dog. The two have been lighting up the, as I like to call, the punchy, kicky action scene since with movies like Accident Man, Triple Threat, Avengement and Debt Collectors, all movies we've spoken about on our podcast numerous times. Uh, welcome to the show, Jesse. How are you this, this fine morning, this fine day? I'm doing well. Thank you very much for having me. It's it's awesome to have you on, man. Um, I recently watched Debt Collectors. Um, I, I saw Triple Threat a wee while back. Um, it, it's shown on Netflix, which is awesome. And um, Avengement, I raved about when um, when it came out on the podcast. So this is this is awesome. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big Scott Adkins really? fan, and it turns out I'm a big fan of yours because you made all these awesome movies. Well, thank you very much. Scott Scott does all the heavy lifting, so I, you know, can't take. It has to be at least fifty fifty on these, and probably probably way more on his on his <laughs> contribution. But he's a great partner to work with. You know, he's very. You know, he gets involved in everything from the development and the script writing down to obviously the choreography is something mm. very, very uh, personal about where the camera placement is. But then with the other stuff, the drama, he, he leaves me leaves me alone. You know, I think the key to a good uh, partnership in, in the arts is knowing where not to interfere with the other guy's yeah. creativity. And for Scott, it's the action. You know, he has a very clear thing. You know, I try and get in there and just make sure we're telling the story and we're catching the dramatic aspects but leave him as much freedom as possible there to work with the choreographer and the stunt mm. coordinator. And he does the sort of same with the dramatic aspects with me. So it's a good, it's a good, you know, it has worked very, very well. We've enjoyed making pictures together. Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's one thing um, doing, like you say, the heavy lifting with the, the fighting and the, the choreography and everything. But if it's not really telling a story that progresses the movie or anything like that, which is sort of your area, I suppose that's where the, the background and stunt, stunt um, choreography and all that comes in. So it's very much a 50 50, yeah. It's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's 50 50, but certainly, certainly we uh, you know, both have a good degree of input into yeah. the other's area. You know, he's obviously very involved in the dramatic aspects as well. I can't cut him off there. And 
like likewise with the with the actor. For sure. Yeah, but my input really comes ahead of filming. You know, I lay out what I want to see, yeah. how I want to see it, where the beats want to come, and then I let them sort of go into it. Uh, the you know having a background of stunts means that I understand there's a human being behind all of that. You can't just push them and push them. You know, mm. we try and get it in the first or second take. Third take, it, things are really falling apart and technically it's, But you don't want to go much more than that because you lose that explosive energy, you know. Mm. And even though Scott's a superhuman kind of, you know, walking animal, you know, CG effect, <laughs> even, even he is human. And if you're going to push, you know, uh, and try and get six or eight takes out of every single setup. You're going to wear your guy out. Uh, and so, yeah. coming from stunts, I'm always trying to be as minimal as possible. I can just keep the heart speed. Look, everyone's good. Muscle memory, and then connect to the camera and keep some of that explosive energy, you know, on the screen. You know, capture yeah. it there as opposed to wasting it in rehearsal. Uh, you know, he's he's brilliant. But I mean, even you know, on this last one, we had a couple of moments where he he got beat up. Less to do with the physical aspect. It was just really hot when we were making Deck Later. <laughs> I think we had 104 degrees for that alleyway fight between who and uh, Louis Mandalore, and it was brutal. We had crew members dropping and you know having yeah. their saline you know injections. <laughs> it was really, it was really, really tough. I mean, uh, people don't realise quite how tough it is. It's harder to film a fight scene than it is to have a real fight. <laughs> you know, it uh, requires more energy, more heartbreak, and quite often more scratch, you know, scratches and bumps. Yeah. It's a bloody great scene as well, to be fair. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, that was uh, that was all Scott right from the very get go. He said, "I want to have a picture that ri- you know, fight scene that rivals they live," and I love that because I yeah. worked with Keith David four or five times. Uh, I'm a huge fan of his, and then I actually did a fight scene with Randy Waddy Piper back in the nice. back in the nineties on a uh, Walker Texas Ranger. And we've worked out this huge fight scene with him. It was Laura Chartrand choreographing it, who's a good, you know, he's still, he's directing, now directing Steven Seagal pictures, I think. Uh, and he put this great fight together. Uh, we rehearsed it probably for, you know, an hour or so, whatever you do. And then they rolled camera, and I looked at Roddy, and he knew instantly he'd forgotten every single bit of choreography. <laughs> the eyes rolled, rolled into the back of his head. He slapped me in the face, <laughs> picked me up over his head, and threw me through a car windshield. <laughs> And I realized that was that was the default position. They plan everything in wrestling, and then they just kind of, you yeah. know, it, they don't hurt you, but it becomes a... It, it, <laughs> that was my initiation into WWE and uh, and what that involved. But he was awesome. You know, That's God, amazing. God rest him. So, so before we um, we get into things, um, one of, the, one of the, the current situation as the world is right now, I don't want to, to dive too deeply into this thing, but obviously um, with coronavirus and COVID and the lockdown and everything, um, I've been asking recently on these episodes how it sort of affected your um, movement within your, your career and within the industry. Um, what's, what's COVID doing on your end kind of thing? Uh, it's a two, twofold answer to that. The first one is it sucks beyond all belief yeah, because yeah. I had huge pictures, you know, actually financed in casting, uh, two of them cast with A-list talent. And this was supposed to be my year 2020 going from, you know, non-union to DGA, my yeah. first DGA, you know, director's Guild of America picture, which is a significant, significant di- difference. It's uh, it's almost like you're an amateur filmmaker. Now you're becoming a professional filmmaker. Yeah. You get residuals and health, health benefits and pension and all that kind of stuff for directing and I feel like for the last 10 years I've been doing it as a part-timer uh, I haven't been able to join the guild because you know the first question out of every producer's mouth is are you DGA or not meaning is this film going to have you as its director or not yeah. <laughs> so I didn't join and so this year was supposed to be a uh, you know a huge you know come, coming out kind of uh, you know uh, step up and then it, it went into into its stalls 100% so that's the negative. Positive is I've written five scripts. I've done <laughs> nice. six, four of those, which are really, really good. Uh, I realized over the last 10 years, I've basically uh, either directed, sold, or, or optioned out everything that I've written, which mm. is, you know, on the one hand, it's like, you know, that's an achievement, my friend. You, you no longer have any scripts left in the drawer from when you were 18 and sort of yeah. started out doing this. The, the, the terrifying part was, oh, shit, I've actually got to go and write some new, <laughs> new material. So it ended up being fantastic. I've got some really great material. My agents are excited about it. You know, uh, we're not putting anything out during the COVID. We don't think people are buying. Yeah. Uh, you know, you read Deadline, and it, it sounds like people are buying, but they really are. They're, they're buying from huge name writers, and you know, it's it's not it's not a buyer's market. People don't know what the 
uh, terrain is going to look like when the smoke clears from this, you know, what it is people are going to be after, whether there really is a seismic shift and people are looking more towards uh, more female-driven, less action, female perspective pictures, or, or, or there'll be a, you know, a huge market for people wanting visual entertainment of the, of the old school type. Yeah. Uh, I personally don't believe there'll be much change. You know, people love watching escapism. You know, they have done since 1908 when the first gunfighter in a silent movie pointed his gun at the camera and fired it, yeah. you know. Uh, I don't think it's, there's going to be any seismic shift, but uh, for the sake of putting a script out and not having it new anymore, we're basically sitting on everything and waiting till it's over. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a little bit of a strange one. Uh, I don't particularly like it. I'm not old enough to take a year off. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm too old. I'm too old off at this point you know uh so we have other projects that, that are going to start sooner than later and, and get this thing going you know especially, uh, especially as well obviously this, there's a protocol a safety protocol you, you know, ah, yeah. when you di- when you're directing you feel a great responsibility to your casting crew you don't want anyone to get ill hurt injured in any way and i have a very very loyal team that have been with me probably for about 10, 15 years, and I certainly wouldn't want to see any of them in any kind of jeopardy. So, you know, we'll be very careful with masks and, yeah. and how they're fed and how wardrobe, makeup, and hair are done. And, you know, it's just something you have to deal with. You know, when you work in a uh, tropical environment, when I did Triple Threat, we were in the jungle and we had insects that could kill you, <laughs> plants that could sting, sting you and put you in hospital, you know, from a plant. So, you know, you, you are, you know, you, you, you always have to come up with some kind of, you know, when we're doing action movies, there's always a, a very strict protocol with regard to safety with guns, oh, gotcha, explosions, yeah. car stunts, motorcycle stunts. So it's not anything too, you know, amazingly difficult to get my head around. It's just, just another another challenge. You know? Yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be tricky. It's a, it's a weird time for for everyone really, but um, movie sets and as well are gonna be a whole different animal, I think, coming out of this, and and hopefully we can all just adapt. They will be. They will be, but as I say, you know, you're always, you know, I've done films on the side of mountains, yeah. <laughs> where if anyone steps wrongly or doesn't have a safety rope on, they, they die instantly. So you, you you have to have a protocol on that. You have yeah. safety harnesses and you have a carabiner and people check, make sure you're safe before you go out and you have only people that are qualified to be there. You do bet the intellectual level of your crew before you put them on a site, you know, into a situation like that. And you're careful, you know. Uh, you, you, you know, as I say, it's, 30 years of doing this, I haven't injured anyone uh, in, a, in a way that was down to my negligence, knock on wood, and I don't intend to sort of, you know, have that change. It's very, very important to us remember when you make action movies, it's only a movie, you know, it is entertainment. Yeah. It's something someone's going to watch from their, from their sofa. Now, that doesn't mean you have to be not passionate about it and put every ounce of your heart and soul and energy and creativity into it. It doesn't mean you don't have to stay up at night trying to make it as great as possible but you don't ask your team to, to risk themselves you know yeah. you don't do that that's not that's not what we do you know no, I'm, with you uh, I'm not in that i'm not in that school of, of filmmaking i think that i think there was a school like that you know the, the early Werner herzogs and you know you read about michael curtis and how he would you know had a reputation for hospitalizing and even killing stuntmen when he was making oh, pictures Jesus. you know silent pictures and early sound ones but we don't do that anymore, and that's that's not that's not filmmaking. It's not made believe. That's that's sort of dangerous. So, and I think the COVID goes with that. Just careful, yeah. basically. And, and there is a set of protocol that you can do. You know, to make sure people are, you know, are, are kept out of danger. Awesome, awesome. I mean, it's it's a question I've been asking because uh, obviously with everything that's going on, and it's it's interesting to get a filmmaker's take on it as well. So that's why I've been asking. <laughs> so um, a lot of the time on our episodes, we speak to um, directors, producers, and all that, and most of them tend to be from the other side of the pond, as in America. But uh, you are a little in a little Englander. You're from uh, Winchester, I believe. Can, I was I was born in Winchester, yeah. and I visited there once or twice. But I uh, grew up in a place called Maidenhead, which is Berkshire. Oh, nice! Windsor, nice. Reading, all that kind of stuff. So, uh, so can and you... it was quiet, and it was you know we had we had a, a big wooded thicket next to us, which was you know ancient an ancient sort of woods, which you know I think I probably filmed for Vietnam, for for <laughs> California, for Arizona. I, I think I filmed it filmed it for probably a dozen different locations through my teens making small movies on Super 8 on VHS, Cam on VHS That's everything I could had all school friends with 
I think one one time we, they were running around with so many. I had so many of them. Uh, we'd had a whole team building wooden guns for them at, at high school, <laughs> and uh, somebody called the police, and the police turned up with with an armed squad. They were terrified of what they were going to find. When they found it was a bunch of fourteen year olds with wooden wooden machine guns, it's, it's, they were very very relieved, and it was sort of a smack on the wrist. And you know, but nowadays. I just shut this and think it would have been a very, very different scenario. But, uh, <laughs> oh, God, back yeah. then it was be very different. You know, it was who dare, you know, trying to make who dares wins and the good, the bad, and the ugly. It's all these sort of uh, roughneck 80s pitches that were, you know, Rambo. Well, actually, it was, it was probably a bit before Rambo. A bit of, oh, you know, I was working then, so it would have been before. But it was a, uh, you know, from those, you know, dodgy old sort of endeavors as a teenager, you, you learned to, you know, to pull the team together and yeah. get them enthused with your passion <laughs> and all those lessons are really not not a hell of a lot changes except the uh, the amount of money you have to play with and the toy box that you can uh, you can access you know so how how did that um playing playing with toy guns and and getting your friends together and and wooden machine guns how did that lead you into becoming i am um, i believe you when you started your career it was as a stunt performer how, how did it lead uh, to I'll, that i i'll try and do it real real quick but uh yeah it was a it was a lot of low budget filmmaking, ton of those. Managed to find a band that wanted to have a music video. They actually paid for it. We got very lucky. It went to number twenty seven. It was a group called Pendragon, which is a very glam rock band. It was shot <laughs> in Wardour Street, and that got me about ten or fifteen music videos from that, oh, which nice. all you know had varying degrees. But unfortunately, we were most successful with the very first one, which is also a terrible thing because the budget and the enthusiasm went down from that point. Uh, and then, you know, I have family in the business. My uncles are both stuntmen, and uh, I, I went crawling on my knees and got a, you know, I've always been sort of trained in that sort of, you know, the line of, you know, martial arts and yeah. gun stuff and cadets, you know. So I was interested in that, as most many 14 year olds are, and managed to talk my way into sort of assisting in storyboarding, drawing storyboards for, for Vic. And, you know, I think the first picture was when I was about 14. Was Universal Soldier, and he had to direct a uh, uh, add-on action sequence at the end of that. It didn't have enough action in it. It was a fight scene where Dolph gets skewered on the combine harvester. Oh, so nice. I storyboarded that nice. in Binfield. Those storyboards were packed to Hollywood, and then he came out to Hollywood and directed it. And that was that was sort of slipped in, you know, as it often is in Hollywood, you know, by a different director whose specialty is action to, mm. to amp the film up, you know. Uh, and it's only like a five-minute sequence. It's from, it's from where he's punched outside of the farm to that sequence. So that was my first taste of sort of getting paid to do anything. And then from that point on, I really assisted him a lot and then moved into stunting because it pays as well. Uh, made the break for the U.S. Uh, well, oh, actually, after Total Recall, I came back and managed to use my entire paycheck from Total Recall to pay for a short film. <laughs> uh, and realized that that was what I really, really wanted to do. Everything else was just sort of a... A part of the journey to get where I wanted to be. I loved it. I've always loved stunting and keeping people safe and creating, you know, uh, imaginative and interesting action sequences. But uh, but ultimately, it was directing and being the author of your own work, which uh, was the was the end goal. You know. Yeah. But in, in the meantime, before you got there, you worked with some some hella awesome awesome directors, the likes of Paul Verhoeven, Terence Malick, Kenneth Branagh at one point, Spielberg. Yeah, it, it, it was a very interesting period. I, I, I did good and managed to you know work my way into directing, and I did a few things. Uh, and then 2008 came, and it smacked me up the side of the head really badly. All of the money that I had for movies fell apart. Uh, I was left completely and utterly high and dry financially. I, I owed money everywhere. Uh, and it was one of those terrifying moments where you're like, oh, my God. And so I, I'd yeah. actually given away my stunt bag, and I had to call my, <laughs> the stunt man who I did this to. I need my, I need my pet bag. I've got to throw my hat back in the ring. <laughs> so he dropped it off. I was too old by that point, really. I was in my sort of mid to late 30s, which is too old to be doing, you know, hitting the ground because you don't recover at the same rate that you do. And I hadn't been in the gym as much as I needed to be, but you do what you need to do. You've got a family, you know. So I, went, I threw my hat back in, uh, and then that year and a half of working like a hound dog uh, put me with Kenneth Branagh, Paul mm. Thomas Anderson, Steven Spielberg, uh, and in a one on one position, sitting by the camera with these guys, listening, hearing, watching their process realizing that you know 
the comfortable position that I thought I was in was actually not nearly as comfortable as it should have been and that this was how films were really, really made. Yeah. And so what, what started as the most terrible sort of blow to my ego <laughs> to go back to stunts, you know, which, by the way, isn't that much of a blow. You know, people no. work their entire lives to work on these kind of pictures. Uh, and that I realized too. Uh, but but also became one of the most amazing postgraduate finishing schools for me. Yeah. And it made me completely rethink what I've been doing. Uh, I heard a saying from Marine Commandos the other day, when in stress, you regress. Uh, mm. A friend of mine who is, a, is, a, nice. is, in, is an officer said, you know, it's a, it's a common fault that they teach all of their guys in survival training. When in moments of stress, you just go back to what you know well. And I realized that was a mistake and that I had to really start thinking about what it was that made a film better, you know, and yeah. not make bloody B movies and think that that was all that was required. You, you actually have to dig deep into character and story. And really, that was the genesis that led to you know, my black and white film, The Beautiful Ones, which is an enormous festival winner. We did like 42 film festivals with it. And that led directly into Savage Dog and all these pictures with Scott, which have, you know, which if you watch them compared to, you know, the early work that I did, they're just like, they, I think they look like they're made by different directors, frankly. You know? Yeah, it's, so, it's funny. In many ways, I'm very thankful for, for 2008 and how it slap me <laughs> it's kind of it's kind of funny you say that because um i, I was and, and this is going to sound a little bit iffy maybe but um watching your your more recent films that you're making with scott and everything when i went onto the imdb and i was looking through other projects you did back when because i did notice you had a period where there was a bit of a break so i had a question based around that but i also noticed that you made green street too which i genuinely have a little bit of a soft spot for green street too but it is it's very different to what you're doing now and and just the feel of it the tone of it but um it just it just threw me a little bit that i saw that that was your movie as well listen making movies is a tough game you know yeah. uh, i made charlie valentine which is a uh, labor of love did mm. very very well won a bunch of awards got picked up by lion's gate uh i was very proud of it but it left me broke uh someone called me and said are you english do you play football and i said yeah yeah sure i play football i never play football and they said do you want to do this film we just lost our director and they were three weeks away from filming and so i jumped on that the script needed to be utterly rewritten it was written by someone i don't think had ever been to england uh, oh, nice. or watched an english film had to be completely every single day had to be rewritten and we took it from we took the film from what would have been an utterly dreadful movie to being one that was just dreadful. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, it's, you know, listen, you, every once in a while you get punched in the nose in the game. You you, you wipe your blood off and you brush yourself down and you, you throw your hat back in the ring. You can't yeah. you can't get too emotional about it. I put, I put everything I had into making Green Street as good as I could. Uh, and I used every trick in the book that I thought I could call on uh, and did my best with it. And, you know, you you're not always going to be successful. You know, this is not a person sitting in front of a piece of paper drawing. You know, you have almost 60 people that all have creative input that you're watching and have to sort of maintain and control. And if there's any element from sound, the color corrections, the editorial, to mm. the music that you don't, you don't succeed on, you run the chance of making a film that doesn't, you know, conform to your vision. And it's, it's tricky. Uh, and that's no excuse. As you know, Anne said, if a film sucks, Direct. <laughs> well, well, no else you can define it. You know, I shouldn't have made the film. I shouldn't have chosen to do it. I shouldn't have agreed to. But baby, rent needed to be paid, and babies need to be fed. Well, as as I say, and I'm not going to apologise. I do have a little bit of a soft spot for the movie, so. <laughs> We actually um, we, we actually bumped into Vernon Wells at a Comic Con um, a few years back, and I asked him about the movie, and he kind of like he kind of looked at me in the eye when I asked him, and he was like, "That's the one you want to ask me about, okay?" <laughs> but he did speak very fondly uh, of it, so he did speak about um, having a good time on the movie and getting to play the governor, as he said. <laughs> yeah, he, he had fun on it, and you know, we we at that point were you know were down to. You know, not being able to find an English guy in LA to hire to play the governor. I loved Vernon, so it was more fun to work with someone I knew and, and enjoyed and to yeah. hang out with. You have to understand, when I was storyboarding and drawing comic books as a fucking, you know, 10 year old, 12 year old in, in the UK, yeah. desperately dreaming about becoming a filmmaker, 
every single one of them featured a bad guy. They had a mohawk and looked very like Wes from the Road Warrior. <laughs> 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 I was obsessed, obsessed with that film. I watched it till the till the tape, you know, had had, had tracking glitches on it. Yeah. You, couldn't, you couldn't see the picture anymore. Uh, I, I, I I copied it. I copied it shot for shot. And I, you know, I was not terribly wealthy growing up, so it was storyboards rather than making films. You draw comic books, you know. And every single one of them, as I say, featured this, you know, this bad guy who I thought was the absolute a- I- iconic, you know, the, yeah. the bad guy to, to finish all bad guys, where never really put together the fact that he was, he's clearly gay. <laughs> as a boy, he <laughs> through the whole movie. As a 14-year-old or 13, you don't really care about that. I think it doesn't matter. It doesn't, it doesn't register. But, but loved it. Absolutely loved it. So the moment I sort of started making pictures out here, you start to look for people like that, you know, yeah. that, that had some kind of a mark on you growing up. And Vernon was one of those. I, I, I've worked with him five or six times. And I, I love him to pieces, you know. I like him as a person, enjoy his sense of humour. Like Australians, anyway, you know. Oh, uh, God. He's, so like uh, English people with a sense of humour. He, he was he, he's <laughs> easily, easily one of my favourite. Uh, uh, you know, the other, the, other, the other people I've looked up, anyone that worked with Sam Peckinpah, any of his collaborators I've, I've tried to hire, Anyone that worked with Kubrick, you know, we in, in England we had a uh, uh, Kubrick Chateau, you know, on on Avengement and on Accident Man, you know, and it's I, I try and have those people around because I just love hearing the stories of, of you know, you realise by <laughs> the thinnest of threads we're all in the same game, you know, oh, yeah. and I like that. So, so you did you did have uh, as you explained a little bit of a blip back in two thousand eight two thousand nine, but come back strong you very much did with them um, meeting up with with Scott Ad- Scott Adkins and not one not two but I've, I believe I counted about six collaborations with the man and and all great movies. Um, how, how well, did, thank you, sir. How did, <laughs> don't thank me, you made them. But um, how did you guys um, fall in together and realize that this was going to be a match made in heaven kind of thing? Well, Scott and I have known each other for a long time. Uh, Isaac Florentine basically saw Scott's reel that he put together in Sutton Coldfield on VHS. Sent to him. And Scott and I, Isaac saw it one night. It was given to him by a martial arts guy that we, we all know. And said, I have, to, I have to work with this guy. And called him and said, you've got to come out here. It doesn't matter what you're doing, come out. And Scott trekked out. He'd done nothing, I don't think, at that point uh, of significance. And Isaac put him up in his house in North Hollywood and, and basically sculpted him, you know, made him into you know, an actor and told him the game and put him out there, told him where to go. And I think he went to Hong Kong and tried to do some films as a stuntman there. You know, and, and Scott's like a sponge. He's a very, very quick study. Yeah. You can show him how to use a gun, a knife, a, a computer, a tool, a car, a motorcycle. He'll watch you and the bastard will be able to do it absolutely perfectly. <laughs> it took you, took you six months to learn it. And he'll watch you and, 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 and be able to do it straight away. He's a very, very interesting intelligent fellow i've run into a few actors who have that ability and it's it's unique you know absolutely unique uh with scott it's certainly to do with physical or dex- dexterity or, or or coordination you know he I, in my opinion he could be a dancer if he wanted to he'd probably be able to be if he set his mind to it he'd be able to do dance movies like fred astaire or or you know uh, gene kelly you know he's absolutely incredibly coordinated uh so he he took to it like a up to water and obviously went to Hong Kong and learned a little bit about that, came back and worked with Isaac. And Isaac and I were having, uh, I think, bagels in the valley with another producer. And he said, you've got to hire this guy. You've got to find something for him. At the time, I hadn't directed anything. <laughs> 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 I was just like, I've written debt collectors, which everyone likes. I've got an agent out of that, take some money out of it. And, you know, that ended up being optioned by about 20 different companies. John Claude Van Damme was attached. Michael Rooker had been attached. Burt Reynolds had been attached. Uh, and so I was I was trying to get into the game at that point. Yeah. And then suddenly Pit Fighter came about, which was a good script, uh, with terrible producers who basically wrecked wrecked the movie. <laughs> uh, I mean, single-handedly, they destroyed that movie. The biggest mistake that a, uh, a novice director can do is to work with bad, with bad producers. They yeah. will destroy you. All of that stuff aside, uh, it was an opportunity to put Scott to work, and he came and worked. And from that point on, we were... You know, gabbing about trying to get a project together, a big one, something cool, something that was. We probably went through four or five different films. One was the, was directing Scott Steven Seagal for Moshe Diamond, and we kept talking. It's like this isn't the one. This isn't the one. Either I would say this is not the one, or he would say this is not the one. And then Sandwich Dog came along, and it felt like the good one for both of us. So uh, we jumped on it. And it's, and it's been yeah. it's been hit after hit really from I, there. I, I, I knew it was my last 
chance at that point, or I thought it was in my mind, so I threw everything I had at it. Every single prop in that movie is out of my personal collection, all the paintings on the wall at my yes. office, the, the desk and the chair that uh, Vladimir had in the scene was from my office. Uh, every gun was from my gun collection. It was, it was, it was, I bought the uniforms, I bought the Jeep, everything I had in my worldly, you know, good went towards making the film as good as I possibly could. It's still tough, it still looks a bit threadbare and you know, it was, you can be over ambitious in this game. You can, as Stone Cold Steve Austin told, told me one time, you've got to be careful about trying to put 10 pounds of shit into a five pound bag. <laughs> uh, and I think with Savage Dog, I was probably attempting to put about 15 pounds worth of shit into a five pound bag. Uh, really, really trying hard. And so what happens is you, you, you win a few of the scenes, but that one scene or two scenes you don't win, end up pulling the whole project. You know, it's you, audiences don't go, oh, I didn't like the film, but that one scene made it great for me. They look at the whole film as a whole and they either walk out satisfied or not. But anyway, Savage Dog did very well, amazingly. People loved it, and it has a sort of strange cult following. Yeah, uh, it's probably the one I get most fan email about, most, most, you know, it's like, <laughs> for about a year and a half afterwards, it's such a painful experience making that film that I'd avoid responding to anything. And, and now it's less painful, and you sort of think back, and, and it's a little more, yeah, so it's a fun one, it's a fun one. <laughs> Everyone got ill. Everyone, everyone got beaten up. Everyone got poisoned. So it was a, you know, it was a. It, there was stunts in that that was so close to the edge. <laughs> Just lost. Uh, but but it was fun. You know, it was an exciting film to make, and we got got a, you know a lot of cool people on it. And made a lot of friends on it. Uh, and as it was, it started our relationship. But Scott and I hated each other afterwards. We thought it was a. I thought that he screwed it up. He thought I screwed it up. <laughs> And then suddenly, somewhere around about the point where we're putting music on it, it's like, it actually turned out okay. That's and uh, he, he, had, he had me initially for Angst of Man and then fired me because uh, he was unhappy with it. <laughs> and then six months later, we both made up and he came back and said, all right, let's, let's do, let's do uh, Angst of Man. So, and at that point, we both knew a little more about how the other worked. Yeah. And uh, it became a very fun relationship. And Angst of Man was a blast. We both have a you know, dirty English sense of humour and you know, and, and have the same sort of slightly jaded feeling about people trying to be, you know, too holy and it, mm. it, it, it worked out it worked out well, you know. And that was so for us really, Excellent Man was the first one where there felt like there was a chemistry between star and director that that uh, that could maintain itself. Cool. Uh, I was offered tri- triple threat while we were finishing Excellent Man, so uh, the first thing I did was said, you've got to have Scott play the bad guy. He's got to do it. And Scott said, Scott said, yeah, I'll do it, but only if you let me fight Vito and Tony at the same time. And I'm like, all right, I think we can handle that. Oh, God, yeah, God, yeah. <laughs> so that, that, that was how that worked. And, uh, and he came out and, and we had a blast out there. I think he I think he makes a great bad guy, you know? Really he, he does make a good bad, good bad guy. He makes a great protagonist as well, but... Is, I don't know. There's something about him. I, I think it's because, and and I I don't know how this is going to sound, but the man is a good looking man, and the man is a brutal man. So when you put that together and you have him being just a bit of a dick, he's just fantastic. Yeah, yeah, no, it's good. He's a he's a good looking kid. He's very good looking, but he's got very very dark eyes. They're almost they're almost black, you know. That's they're not what... dark brown. They're, they're almost black. So. It's it's squirrely. So you have a good looking guy, but then the camera pushes in and you realize there's nothing there for you to hook onto as you do with normal people, you know? Mm-hmm. Where you can tell a lot about a person by how pale blue their eyes are, green, brown. You can you can see a lot more going on. With Scott, there's a mystery there because it's almost almost you know, the the, the pupil's almost completely hidden. And so you have a guy that, that initially you think, Yeah, he's, you know, he's, he plays a good good guy and then you realise there's a there's a real <laughs> capacity there for sort of mystery and I think that's what plays well when he plays a bad, bad guy you know and, and that would um, take me on to a movie where he doesn't look as, as good looking as usual which is uh, Avengement which I, I just yeah. honestly my, my friend my, my hat is off to you for this movie because it completely took me by surprise I was really looking forward to it because obviously Scott's in it um, so it was like all British cast all British crew kind of just like but it absolutely de- delivers on all fronts. Like the fights are insane, the comedy is just brilliantly British and dry. A nice little eclectic cast. I think Avengement is a fantastic little movie. But 
How did this movie? Thank you. How did this movie come about in your mind? Well, I, I wrote a script uh, that I, on Thor when I was when I was on on the Brana picture. You know, yes. what I find is when I'm in a job, when I'm feeling a little in the old days when I was feeling a little creatively stumped. <laughs> you know, hitting the ground or going to work every day and sitting in New Mexico. Again, very lucky to be there. Very, very proud to be there and, and being as professional as I could. But when you come home, you, you need an outlet for your creativity. Yeah, so I wrote, yeah. uh, I wrote the script. Uh, when we were doing Excellent Man, I realized that Scott had this ability to play a, a big classic anti-hero and do a really, really bloody good job with it. You know, really <laughs> sort of, you know, you're interested in him. You know, it's far better than playing the, you know, the doughy-eyed, you know, good guy, which he doesn't, you know, I don't think is his, is his, is his highest strength, you know. Uh, and so I kept trying to pitch him on this script. <laughs> and probably for a year or so, I, I tried and tried. Finally, he read it. And he says, yeah, I like it. I like it. I love the way he takes on everyone at the end, the entire, you know, everyone. <laughs> uh, so he, he, he had Stu Small, who we work with consistently, who's very, very good, do a polish on it and, and adapt it and make it a Scott movie, make it funnier, uh, you know, just, just, you know, you, I, I take writers wherever I can. And, you know, it's a good, if it's good ideas, it's good. And Stu is very good. So Stu did a pass on it, made it a really strong script. And we, uh, we were lucky enough to have this sort of relationship with Weiberg where they said, as long as you keep it below this dollar point, mm. don't make it, you know. So, uh, so, so we went back to England. Well, I seem to have really good luck. I love it. I love filming in England. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure yeah. if I'll ever live there again, but I love going to film. I love the crew of the locations. I like the food. And I, I have a passionate love for the, for the actors there. I mean, it's just so good. We had Craig Fairbrash. It's something along the lines of 90 episodes of EastEnders. So you have this cat in there who's incredibly quick at getting the character, putting it together, learning his lines and being where you need it, you know, and, and you, you forget all of that. And it's, it's brilliant. You know, even, even uh, uh, Kirsten, the gal we had behind the bar. Yeah, Kirsten is, Ware. Is an EastEnders regular. And her, her acting was awesome. <laughs> she she, she, she you know? is, uh, I, I love everybody in this film, and, and you have got a wickedly just brilliant sort of um, British people that you, you know and you love, which is why I really drew, drew me to the film in the first place. And Kirsten Ware in Behind the Bar... Just the little, the little nods that she's given to Scott's character, and the little bit of chemistry she has with him. You just uh, you, you instantly fall. But, in but a lot of that came down to Joe Farimi, who was the producer, who's, yeah. who's a sensational casting producer. He gets out there, pulls these people in. We didn't get Thomas Turgus until uh, 10 p.m. the night before he played a scene. It's an eight-page scene, oh, God. or something like six pages. And it's, oh my God, it's terrifying. But you know, you, you have to get the best cast. You don't give up. You don't give up two weeks before filming with the guy that's okay. You keep pushing. You keep pushing until you get the very best. And sometimes that's the night. That's the night before. It's a nerve-wracking experience making movies. But uh, but Joe was cool. He was, you know, he and Jeremy Zimmerman, who's a traditional casting director on the picture, did very good. But a lot of the credit comes down to Joe and his his you know a little black book of people he knew. You know. <laughs> And you, you mentioned it a quick second ago when, when Scott's basically saying, I get to take on everyone uh, in the bar. This is awesome. Um, I mean, the climactic fight at the end of the movie, that, that it kind of makes the Kingsman bar fight look a bit like a pillow fight. It's like... How, uh, I love that. Thank you. How do you even start planning that fight in a, in a confined space with all your core cast are there and you've got the likes of Mark Strange, well, you've got Nick Moran, you've got Craig Fairbrass, you know, it's it's a fantastic I, scene. I, I I wrote a description in the script and that's as far as my involvement went, you know, with the dialogue. Yeah. From that point, it gets handed over to Dan Stiles, Luke McFontaine and Scott, the three of them, and they absolutely went to town with it and they really worked incredibly hard to make sure that each of those guys had a particular style and the props were made up and break away and I mean it was a you know it was a real creative endeavor I stood back and you know uh, I was there on set and throwing my 10 cents but really if you are a director who is smart you don't try and get too involved you know yeah. you watch for performance you make sure the eyes are being shown you make sure that they're interacting with the characters the way they should but if the guys have choreographed it for the last month and, and know where camera placement should be because they've shot previews on their phone or on a video camera. Nice. You don't fuck around. You don't get involved. You don't slow it down. You don't throw a, uh, a spanner in the works. You you back off and give them the room to do what they 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 do best. You know. And uh, 
they've shown me previews. They've shown me what they had planned. Uh, I knocked out some stuff. There's one scene where someone was going to get set on fire. I think they had whiskey put over them in a, in a match. And I was like, no, nah, if you do that, there's two things. The first thing is not going to be nearly as big a fire as you guys have in your imagination. Yeah. The safety aspect. And the second is, you know, we're going to be down for two hours making a situation where it's safe uh, before we actually shoot it. And we can't afford to do that because we just don't have time. Yeah. So uh, we, you know, we, we nixed that particular gag. But, you know, otherwise it's pretty much uh, as Stan, Luke and Scott had uh, interpreted the script is that how you kind of work on on your on all your other films as well the likes of um with triple threat you've got scott adkins obviously michael jai white you've got Ico, uh, you've got yeah, triple threat was tim man and tim tim is uh probably the most detail oriented of all of the choreographers i've worked with everything is laid out very precisely uh very very detailed uh and beautifully like a puzzle uh luke and dan are very good very creative luke is my guy from the states i've been working with for 20 years uh it's a bit looser with him you know because i tend to interrupt and throw my 10 cents in and things change but uh with with tim it's very concise and precise uh tim was excellent man and triple threat and i love working with all of them you know uh, but yeah you don't you know these films are made quite rapidly you know yeah. uh, you talk about these you know the chinese pictures it man or hong kong pictures they, they they're shooting for months you know, months and months. We we are less than a month for the whole movie, mm. so you have to be a lot more coordinated, and a lot of your planning involves not getting in the way of people, you know, and allowing them to do what they've already planned ahead of time, capturing it as beautifully as possible, but not not causing them to have to shift or come up with new ideas, or you know, if if it's all possible, so that you can get in and out of there as as rapidly as possible. It's almost like a uh, a heist, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you, you want to get in and out, do what you need. Make sure you've got as much as you can. Every safe is cleaned out, and you're you're on your road onto the next scene. And, and that involves you know, trusting the people you work with. You know, I like that. Uh, I like and that and definition. if you have specifics within the fight you want, you let them know ahead of time. You know, yeah. make sure we get that cool headbutt. You know, I want to see the scene where he bites his ear off. You know, <laughs> uh, and this one I think he should bite his nose off, <laughs> knock his teeth out. I want to see the teeth come out stuck in the back of his fist. You can you, you're specific with your creative, uh, and then that, that if they're good at what they do, they. Uh, creatively work that into their choreography, you know. One one of the one of the questions I do want to ask is, um, I kind of been going through your your movies and, and having a re re rewatch of them um, of previous um, fairs, much like Accident Man. I hadn't seen that for a wee while, but um, a lot of your movies are kind of male centric, male orientated. Do you think there's maybe a place that you could um, throw in? So, some female action stars. I mean, like Amy Johnson is fantastic. Yeah, She's fantastic in Accident Man. You know, it's a mistake that my films have been that way up to this point. It's, no, no, I'm not. I'm not saying that the, to be with, disparaging. With the, just... Scott, with the Scott pictures, it's the way they've worked yeah. out. And as I say, a lot of the time projects are financed and sort of uh, laid out for you before. You know, there's a lot less a case of I got this great script. So I've got to go out and get it financed. <laughs> that happens maybe. Maybe if you're lucky, five percent of the time. But every other, the ninety-five percent of the other gigs that get financed have been financed with a star. Yeah, definitely. Sometimes with a script, with an outline. So, you know, I, I tried very hard with Triple Threat. You know, there was no DJR character. I created that and threw that into the script and, yeah. and tried to use her as much as we could. It's so funny because you read some of the uh, reviews where they're like, "Oh, you know, criminally underused DJ Yen in." It's like, <laughs> she wasn't even in the script. When you're talking about. You know, I I created everything for her. So you, you you know, but you, we have to, we have to, because that audience is so important now, uh, yeah. and it's the way the world is now, you know, as well. And that's if you want a big budget, you know, film to recoup itself, you have to go after that audience, and the audience is, is absolutely swayed by by women. You know, I have two daughters and a and a wife who are very, very critical of my choices in, in scripts. So, you know, this next film I'm doing now has a female protagonist, and it is very very much. Uh, towards that, and I don't think it should turn off any of the regular crowd. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't think, think they'll be offended in any way. You know, they'll watch it with the same degree of enthusiasm if it's done well. You know, you're not, you know, you're not simply taking a male character and giving it a female name. You, you, you know, I work with a female writer, Catherine McEwen, for the last two scripts, who's come in and tailored what I've written and made it made it strong on a uh, 
from a female perspective, and I think 100%, you know, we have to be making more films like that. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but yes, in answer to your, your <laughs> very astute question, yes, that's certainly where we have to think about going and where I'm thinking about going, for sure. You know, I'm being very careful with the pictures that come in now and making sure they have a strong female character or protagonist uh, that just gives you gives them a feeling of 21st century as opposed to mm. rehashing you know as much as i love the whole oh this is like a you know love letter to the 80s or the 90s as much as that's meant in the most glowing of sort of uh of ways it, it's still smart a little bit when you read that because you're like no it wasn't <laughs> the 80s the 90s at all it's, you know what are you talking about but you realize they're using it as a compliment but it's like no i've read one where they they, they say uh it's like a it's like a love letter to the old canon film. It's like I hated canon film. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, I thought I they think, were terribly made for the most part. I think you know, the it audience... was dreadful. I remember I remember being very excited about Delta Force because it had Lee Marvin in it. <laughs> and thinking, God Almighty, this is dreadful crap, you know. Uh, I, I, think, you know, I had I a lot of the... lot of work with the British military and special forces uh, uh, when I was very young, and it's uh, this is just terrible. <laughs> So, uh, but, but I get that, you know, when an 18-year-old or a 22-year-old reviewer uses that mm. in the 21st century, he means it in, in the highest terms, <laughs> and it's a sort of compliment in his mind, but it's, yeah, it's a funny thing, isn't it? For Benjamin, we were looking at, obviously, you know, Tarkovsky, we were looking at Bronson, we were looking at, we were looking at highbrow, <laughs> uh, McVicker, highbrow pictures that, you know, oh, some, yeah, McVicker isn't necessarily highbrow, but films that were certainly made by by writers and directors at the at the height of their powers, mm. you're trying to you're trying you're trying to like that. You're not, you know, you're not you're not looking at canon movies or uh, PM entertainment films. You know, they're just just dreadful old crap. <laughs> so uh, that's that's how it was. In fact, there were probably six or eight shots that were full on Tarkovsky ripoffs in Avengement, long slow pushing that ended up getting cut out because they sort of changed the. The dynamic of the picture, <laughs> but yeah, looking at it now, it's probably it was probably a wise choice. But uh, they're really interesting pictures, and I've always thought that if you can bring elements of that kind of filmmaking into these uh, genre pictures, which yeah. are made from it, you know, they're financed by an international distributor. These guys really have very very little uh, interest in the domestic or UK market. But, you know, these films are being sold to countries that don't speak English as a first language, and they do very, very well there. Scott is better known there than he is in the English-speaking world, you know, for the time being. And so it almost gives you carte blanche to be able to thread as much of RT and high material in there as you possibly can in between the fight things which you have to deliver. So uh, that's what I've been trying to do. Do, do you think that's maybe something that um, over the next couple of years is kind of going to change in, in the likes of... Um, your more your more straight to market kind of DVDs and whatnot and, and movies. I don't, know. You don't know. I think it's I think it's marginalised. I don't think I don't think the, the foreign market has much strength to it. It's vanishing very very quickly. Yeah. Those guys don't pay to watch movies. They stream them for free. I think the market domestically, Netflix, has become very difficult. They've started making their own films now. They're yeah. buying less, and the audiences are, are are wanting more interesting material. They don't want to see a guy doing a great sidekick. That's not that's not what sells pictures. I mentioned before. They, they want an interesting story, interesting characters. They want, you know, broad vistas. You know, uh, yeah. I don't think I don't think there's much future in in, in the traditional genre action pictures. And I, I've never really liked them. Liked them. I, you know, <laughs> I've been lucky with Scott because he is such a great actor and worth more. Uh, but he just has to be careful not to do too many subpar pictures. You know, yeah. and that's that's very difficult because, as I mentioned before, we're in this. For the art, but we're also in it because we have bills to pay and families to feed, you know. So it becomes a difficult, a difficult uh, balance to maintain, you know, between what's going to be a good movie and what's going to come back and bite you in the ass when you try <laughs> to go to get a studio movie. They'll say, no, you just did this terrible, terrible film in, in Russia, you know, what, you know, or, or, or Thailand. Why, why would you know he's going to bring down the quality of this film when in actual fact there's very little way to have made that other film good you know you went and did as good as you could it's a very very it's it's very interesting we'll see we'll yeah, see it's... uh scott has way more talent than is required to be a mega star has way more charisma is more knowledgeable and if it were if it's it was a merit-based industry 
he'd be at the very top. He'd be, he'd be on a par with Leo and Brad and all those guys, oh, in my opinion. Else. You know, he's something uh, else. And, and you have one good director see a Benjamin and say, "Shit, I need. I, I can use Scott in this next project." Mm -hmm. And it's you know an interesting indie that Scorsese produces, and suddenly, suddenly he's he, he's the guy that everyone likes, and yeah, we knew about you know, and that and that's. That's the other wonderful thing about this industry, you know. So I would love to see that happen. <laughs> so, hope so would I. So would I because um, I, I love my I love my British actors and and I, and I always want to see them do well. And and this is a guy who over the years, when uh, just about everything I've seen him in, I'm sitting there going, why is this guy not, as you say, sitting at the top? Scott well, borrowed and, and you know stole you know and, and put together. I think it's something like thirty or forty grand of his own money. And this is this is a guy who's you know who's is just another working schmo like the rest of us, yeah. you know, so that he could buy the right to act and, and, you know, flew himself to Spain and sat with the with the writer, the comic book writer, and did that, you know, not knowing, and, and then was only able to get a year, I think. <laughs> and so he has, he's only got a year to get the film made. He was absolutely terrified, and this is very, very difficult to make films, and it's, it, you know, it takes a force of will. Uh, when I did the Wonder Woman trailer, it was quite interesting. You know, I, I, I went out and paid for this Wonder Woman trailer because no one had done anything with Wonder Woman at that point. I thought, mm -hmm. this will be fun. I did it. Uh, and it was it was the first time I'd had a, you know, a million hits in one day. It was absolutely crazy. <laughs> the phone was ringing off the hook. It was a very, very bewildering yeah. and strange and almost frightening experience. It was, it was very odd. And Warner Brothers called me in. Uh, DC Warner Brothers are there, and it was a very, very nice producer. And I went. It was my first meeting at Warner's. Warner's are, you know, notoriously difficult to break into. They do not give breaks. You know, they take mm -hmm. you if you're established. They even admit to that. And I ended up going like five or six sort of meetings backwards and forwards. And uh, Nina, who, who played my Wonder Woman, when she went in and did the, she went and cast for the actual movie. She said they used stills from the shot that I had that were on the wall of the casting <laughs> offices and they were saying this is what we're looking for and she said you know that's me right <laughs> but uh but it was a uh, it was an interesting interesting time and, and it, that was an eye-opening experience yeah that's mad what was also interesting for me was that the Wonder Woman short came out the same time as my film with Stone Cold Steve Austin the the the, the package and the Wonder Woman short teaser did more for my career you know an eight thousand dollar investment did more for my career than going off to Canada for three months and directing that film with Dolph Lundgren and Stone Cold, which basically got a good review in the LA Times and then just vanished, you know, vanished to the international foreign market. You know, it's awesome. Uh, I always forget you worked with Stone Cold as well. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's, I got like, very good friends with them. We had three different films planned, and then he had the, the, the knee issue, and that was it for movies. As far as yeah, he was concerned, yeah. I'd say don't try and get yourself involved in a low-budget film. Because the chances of making it fantastic are very low. Do yourself, it's, you know, make a really great trailer for a really great short, and and you know, spend some time making it beautiful and put that online. Because if it if it if it hits, you have a far better chance of getting notoriety than you do from a you know, and a lot lot better chances of making something that looks polished and, and beautiful than a, than a feature, which, which as we mentioned before, can be let down by the weakest yeah. link. Yeah. And brother, there are a lot of links on a feature. <laughs> yeah, it's 90 minutes. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about your, your latest movie, which has been released, which is uh, Debt Collectors, with the yeah. awesome Scott Adkins again and Lewis Mandelor, who I'm going to be completely 100% honest, I hadn't seen him in, in much else. And I think this guy is just an absolute modern day leading man. I think this guy's just awesome. He's got that traditional look of Hollywood cool, but just, you know, just like Mickey Rock used to be kind of thing. This guy's awesome. Um, yeah, I love, I love Louis. Louis is phenomenal. He's like a secret weapon, you know? He's, he's and, just, and the funny thing is, like, he plays so well with Adkins, and um, the two of them have fantastic chemistry. Did they just have that, like, instantly, or did they have to work a little bit on that? Or uh, Scott and I didn't know what we had, you know? Yeah. Uh, we we cast around. We had you know uh, Sue is based on a friend of mine called Jerry Trimble, who was who was the original Golden Boy, who was a debt collector, and who I used to go jogging and, and <laughs> hitting the hitting the bag with. And all the stories that Jerry told me made Sue the debt collector, you know. Uh, and I'd wanted Jerry to play the part, but Jerry lives up in Canada now and has a very good career as a TV actor up there and couldn't make it down. And so I had to hire someone else to play Sue the Golden Boy. It was quite heartbreaking. Uh, so we went out to a lot of different actors, uh, 
uh, Louis Mandelor was recommended. I cast him before for Charlie Valentine and, and wanted him, and the producers had not wanted him at that point. They felt he was too saturated, done too many movies oh. of varying quality, which I think is a is a heartbreaking reason not to hire an actor. Definitely. But in the, 90, in, in, in the early 2000s, it was a big deal, you know. Uh, now less so because a lot of these Netflix films are made, are made up of actors that have done exactly the same. But there was a point where, you know, your your product lived or died by these these casts and their decisions. Yeah. You know? And they 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 nixed my decision to hire him, and I was heartbroken. I told him, I'm going to find something for you in the future. We're going to work together. You know, I love what you did. It was it was terrific. And I think you probably thought I was, you know, talking out the side of my mouth. But we hired him on, on this one, and Scott and I had no idea what we had on our hands. We did the first scene, which is actually their first scene meeting in the, uh, in the Cadillac. Mm-hmm. And he started coughing and spluttering and hitting his chest. And by, Scott and I looked at him, he's going, oh, what's going on here? You know, he's, he's going to make it through the whole shoot. The guy's obviously really not looking after himself. And then we realized, it, it was almost the, the realization at the same time between Scott and I, even though he's in the scene and I'm sitting right next to the camera, I tend not to sit by the monitor, I prefer to sit by the actors, you know? Yeah. Uh, and by the third take, we realized the cough and the splattering were coming on exactly the same point in the dialogue. <laughs> and and you have that sudden, sudden epiphany where you're working with someone who's actually better equipped and more, more uh, well, you know, more in depth and has done his homework more than me or you know and it was it was that sudden feeling where oh shit this is actually gonna this is actually gonna be one of those kind of shoots you know? and it was really quite exciting and both of us said this is fucking cool you know so was the this, was this, it like a... this is not how e- either of us had seen the character neither of us had a very clear yeah. idea at that point we we'd written it and to come up with it and then he suddenly said what to life uh like that and you realize oh shit <laughs> that is him. That's Sue, <laughs> and it was really exciting. And from that point on, that film became very, very exciting. You, you jump out of bed in the morning, you know. You want to keep sitting for sixteen hours because you're just interested by what's going on. You forget to shout cut because you want to know what happens next in the scene, yeah. <laughs> and you forget you're watching, you know, watching it, watching it play out. You're like, it, it, it's it's awesome working working with talent the level of Louis. It's, it's really great. So I try and bring him in everything I can. I don't give a shit what he's done before. I don't care. It doesn't bother me. You know yeah, what I oh, what definitely. I care about is what they do on your on my set. You know, on my on my film and how they make that work. That's that's my concern. And uh, he's brilliant. Uh, he's he's really really good. Whatever his backstory is, whatever has come before, whatever life he's led comes out in 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 that character. Yeah. And it's there. And it's in three dimensions. And you feel it. And you sense it. And it makes your dialogue that you've written come alive and that's something special that's that's a form of uh, that's, 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 that's that's a form of making gold you know yeah. it's a uh, it's a magic i, I did um i did kind of i did kind of wonder how these two were gonna gonna play off each other a little bit because obviously it's it's sometimes when you watch these sort of i don't really want to say buddy buddy movies but they it kind of is a little bit of one of them and and the relationship can feel a little bit forced if you will like they're they're just sort of acting alongside each other but in this in in these movies it it feels like these two guys they're not really acting alongside each other they're kind of playing with each other it's it's a great aspect and i love what 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 louis does as a great actor is he has no ego at all there's no complaining there's no there's no complaints there's no uh pushback there's no nothing at all (laughs) <laughs> and it's, it's almost terrifying because you realize if I asked him to stand in the road in front of a car because it would look good if I, if I saw the car hit him, he'd look at me, he'd roll his eyes a little bit, and then, he, and then he'd boot to go and stand in the road, and that's terrifying. And that forces you to be responsible as well, you know? Yeah. Uh, he, he's, he's, it's, it, and so when he committed totally to being that character, he gave Scott the ability to sort of do what he wanted because he knew that, Louis would be in character and would be ready for it, you know, would be ready to hit the ball back, so to speak. Uh, I mean, you know, we went off book a tremendous amount in both movies, you know, and that's that's so important, you know. That's and so the cool. two of them are working very, very hard behind the scenes, running the, running the scenes, just making sure they work properly like a well-tuned engine, you know. That's uh, it's so great cool. fun. It's great. They're great fun pictures to make. Uh, 
with the exception of the budgets being extraordinarily low. <laughs> but you have a balance in this town. You know, if you want freedom, creative freedom, a lot of the time that doesn't that means you don't have a lot of money to play around with. You know, uh, you know I have friends who who would refuse to do a film for for the money that we've made those pictures for, but they, you know, three years pass and they're still refusing to do a film. While I've shot four films, you know, yeah. and my craft is getting better each time, and my confidence and your ability to act and your knowledge, and you know, and you sort of make this decision, you know, every once in a while you get broken, you had a broken nose, you know, the Green Street Hooligans, or or <laughs> my acting in the in the balls a little bit, but uh, you know, you tried, I tried my hardest, did my very best. Uh, both those cases, I came in a little late to the game, and, mm. and so I'm, I'm watching that. If you, you try, you realise there's only so much you can do without adequate lead time, you know. Well, well for me, uh, I think, I think um, that that collector's for for me personally is is one of your your best looking movies, if you will, because you. It, it it's sleek, it's it's very slick. The score, the music, the music is fantastic. <laughs> Sean and is fantastic. The, Sean Murray, who writes for me. Uh, he is literally my oldest LA friend. You know, I used to sleep on his floor when I first came out. I had a motorbike in you know, a little while there where there was nowhere, living in houses and fence couches. And as you do when you move to a new country, and, uh, you know, we yeah. were talking movies. His dad is uh, Don Murray, who was in Bus Stop with Marilyn Monroe and did, you know, Hassel of Rain with Steve McQueen and worked with Jimmy Cagney on, you know. And so uh, that was very exciting for me always to hang out at their place and hear the old stories and, and sean is a is a magnificent talent oh definitely totally totally without ego uh i think the score that he did for a benjamin i think we have something like four hundred thousand uh listeners on youtube it's it's become this incredibly awesome. sort of successful piece of music in the middle east uh and it's heartbreaking you know it's a really really brilliant piece of music uh it, it is, the music he wrote for me for a beautiful one uh which is based Quite heavily on you know the English film Get Carter and uh, the Ponte Corvo picture, the Battle for Algiers, and uh, the the music for that one is the music that we ended up fine tuning <laughs> and stealing to become Tech Collectors and you know Tech Collectors Part Two. Awesome. So you know we we have fun, you know we have fun with these pictures and we have you know same sort of slightly. Uh, archaic interest in digging out material and digging out movies that weren't seen very much and have these fantastic scores that maybe can inspire us you know mm -hmm. that, that people that. aren't expecting so so are you are you planning on maybe doing a part three or bringing these two guys back i don't know you, you don't know yet? i don't know everyone wants to do it everyone wants it the fans <laughs> want it uh scott and louis want it uh uh the second one is very difficult for me it was it was too little money i put myself in hospital uh I was a stunt coordinator and, and a couple of friends at the time had to actually take me to the emergency room because it got, got a little bit, you know, in the, in the pickups, which I was producing and directing, stunt coordinating, doing yes. special effects, guns, or became just, it, it, uh, I had never run into it before, and it was it, it was a case of sort of overexhaustion, dehydration, and the stress level was a bit crazy. We had some incidents on set in, during the pickups where uh, some things went wrong, and it was... Uh, it's very tough to make yeah. the low budget action picture the way that I like to make them. You know, I don't, I don't really use visual effect muzzle flashes or everything's practical and, and, and there's an inherent risk involved with that. Yeah. And you see it on the actor's faces when they fire a gun with blanks in it. You see an actor shooting an airsoft gun that people are going to then paint in the muzzle flash later mm -hmm. and there's no fear. There's no, you know, they're, they're posing. They're, they're pointing an arm at object and pretending it's firing yeah you give them a real gun with blanks in it that's dangerous you know they can't point it at people it's in a danger zone about 15 meters out of the front of a machine gun you know with blanks they'll shred things you know the unburned powder is extraordinarily dangerous it's loud uh it shakes and the actor's face changes the eyes change the look in their body posture changes and they become something that the audience uh recognizes yeah there's a fear there's a fear there and a danger and and the same with the blood hits, you know. A blood hit never goes off quite how you expect it to. You know, it's bigger, smaller. It affects the actor in a different way. Sometimes they don't feel it. Sometimes they, uh, you know, it kicks them like a mule kicking them because they've accidentally let the shirt fall away from the body. And so as the squid goes off, it, it, it slaps them and will leave a bruise, <laughs> which is not something to lose. But, but the reaction on the person getting shot can be very, very interesting to capture on film, whereas if you're painting that on and you're asking the actor to do the Lee Strasberg and pretend to be shot, 
you know, just act like you've just been hit by a bullet and, you know, how oh, are they going to do their best, you know, kind of, I, I don't know, there's something that I like, the severity that comes from not yeah. knowing what's going to happen, and I think the audience feels it, but it's dangerous and it's stressful and it takes a lot of time and patience, and you're out there doing your picture that way, and then they come out with Extraction or John Wick where they didn't use a single live gun in the whole movie, every single, <laughs> every single gun in that is, is fake, and, you know, consequently you've got guys acting like they're, you know, doing a dance sequence with the gun, which is utterly preposterous. Anyone who's ever fired a gun or, or even watched footage of people in actual combat realize that it doesn't work like that, no matter how brave or cool you are, you know? <laughs> and, uh, you know, we're going further and further that direction. So, I don't know. I love those movies. And I, I love you know, I love, love the way they look, so maybe, maybe I'm a part of the problem, <laughs> not the solution. But, yes, long answer to the fact that making pictures at this budget level is very difficult and I'm just not sure if I have the desire to keep dipping into low budget you know the pictures that I have in development are, are bigger movies now uh, with bigger names and, and have proper budgets and do I want to go back <laughs> I don't know it's uh, you know you wonder how much uh, how many years you're knocking off the other end of your life when you, when you get very very stressed out making, making small ones you know definitely and, and, I, and I feel like, um, like like you say you've been do, do, doing movies now for a good t- twenty odd years, kind of thing. Um, you, you, you wanna you wanna get bigger and you wanna get better and you wanna you wanna push yourself further. So it's, yeah, it's yeah. Well, the way I said, I've done three years and a bit of these Scott pictures, and I think they turn out really, really well. Yeah. Each one better than the last one. Both Scott and I, uh, our game has improved by working together. Uh, he's worked with sensational directors, so I'm a big, big fan of Isaac Florentine, and uh, he's done some big, big movies as well in small roles. So, you know, as long as he keeps mixing it up, I think it'd be fantastic. I think Scott should possibly think about directing at Collector 3. He knows the material so intimately, and I, I wouldn't mind doing a producer role on it, but I'm just not sure if I want to. I'm not sure if it's healthy at a certain age to keep uh, spinning the roulette wheel with low budget movies, you know. Yeah. Uh, the, the chances of them coming out really well requ- it requires so much involvement, you know, dedication uh, and also, as I say, I'm moving up to Director's Guild of America and at that point it becomes difficult to make a low budget film anyway because it's not only the director it's the first assistant director and the second and the second, second and the uh, <laughs> production manager that also all have, have to become uh, guild and yeah. so your film just steps up in another budget level anyway and it's, it's it's the natural progression of things. So, but I would love to see a deck collector three. And as I say, I think either Louis or, or Scott are both both more than qualified to direct it and would do a fantastic job. And I'd love to be involved in a creative role. But uh, but yeah, you, you you have to know enough is, is enough. I think at yeah. a certain point with you know, and move on to new territory. For me, as I say, my friend that was in the commando, the marine marine commando. You know, uh, when we are under stress, we regress. Yeah. And, you know, the natural thing, the smart thing and the intelligent thing is to go where you haven't been before and to, to, to push, you know, and, and to do things that are challenging, not, not necessarily to keep repeating yourself. Although, having said that, my favorite directors, Ford and Hawks and all these guys, they kept going back to the bucket. They went back to the well every time they needed to. It seemed to work for them, but... You know, that, that was a different era, you know. Now well, we're very, very much based, you know, we're judged by the last film. Well, there's nothing to stop you coming back in about five or six years and doing, I mean, there'll be about seven by then, coming back and doing a Deck Collector 7. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've got a couple of pictures that are sort of, you know, 15, 10 million dollar pictures that, that would be very, very good for Scott and really take him to the next level as well. I want to see him, him move up. I want to see us both move up. And I think maybe a version of a buddy movie you know, with bigger cast and bigger production values and we get a longer shoot and, and, and familiar characters with the deck collectors. But you just see a, uh, you see the advancement, you know. That's so that good feeling that people watch and go, oh, I'm getting my, I'm getting my money's worth for this picture, you know. So that's... I've tried to do that in the past with the smaller ones. It's also it is really good to hear because a lot of the a lot of the guys that we speak to not not everyone we we have a few exceptions that um, you can clearly see that while they do low budget now they they're going to be someone um sometime soon and it's it's good to hear that you're sort of like it's time to 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 break out and to and to do it and go for it and the last 2 3 years of your movies as you say you have progressively got better and better i mean i i loved avengement uh, Tri- triple threat Thank fantastic you. but 
triple threat is you've just got some of the best of the best guys in there and oh, so much fun making it such, such a great experience making it such a wonderful cast everyone on it i mean they sat in the ring of seven or eight people depending on how many we had on each day and they, they were laughing chatting just coming up with that they were all competing all wanted to be better than the other guy with the other martial arts four tigers fight didn't come till the end of the schedule and he was desperately concerned that we were going to minimize his fight because it was coming at the end of the schedule. Yeah. And every day I'm getting these texts. Oh, when are we going to do mine? I, 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 need, I, I want to show what I can do. And it was, <laughs> that was, it was just a really, really fun, fun deal. And the film turned out really well. And then, and then they re-edited it, you know? Oh. And it was <laughs> like, but everyone has seen the film and it's a, it's a fantastic movie. But what happened was they had certain obligations, which I hadn't been informed of. Right. Uh, with the Chinese censors and, the, and you know, that needed to conform to a, uh, a sense that the Chinese element was behind the success of the lead characters in the film, which right. if they told me about <laughs> when we were writing the damn script, it would have been easy to have, have uh, delicately and organically woven. But what happened was they, uh, they did it themselves afterwards, you know, went off to China and shot some sequences without telling me and edited them into the film. And you look at <laughs> you look at what they paid, and you're like, well, you know, the fight scenes are there, and yeah. you know, there's some some of the stuff I shot photography wise, but it ain't the, it ain't the story anymore. And there's a there's a huge glitch in the middle that contradicts itself. <laughs> and this is what the email said: We're going to do it this way, and that scene is going to be reshot. It can either be you, or we'll find someone else to do it. And oh. I kept the email, and I might even I might even print it up and frame it. Because that's that's ultimately what happens if you're not on the same page as your producers when yeah. you start a film. They will, you know, you know. And the film was very good. Everyone who saw it, including all of the agents involved, the first cut of the film said, "This is dynamic. This is cool. The story is good. We don't know how you've done it. Even our kids love it." And then, <laughs> and then, 16 months of <laughs> of changes coming from sources that were dubious at best oh. were instigated. So the fact that the film came out and, and actually did resonate with fans. Uh, and did well, did very, very well. Uh, it was amazing, and it was, you know, it was, it was thrilling and good, but but an enormously painful learning experience for me, that film. Oh, it's mad. It's mad, it's mad, because genuinely, genuinely, when, when I watched that, I, I think it's a great little film, and it's mad to oh, hear... wonderful. Well, it's, that's good. It's mad to hear that. The, the, then forget the, everything I've just told you. <laughs> I've I've taken up too much of your time, so I'm going to start wrapping it up a little bit now. Um, but as I suppose we've kind of already touched on it a little bit. Um, you've got five scripts that you've written in the in the last few months. Um, yeah, yeah, moving on to to doing bigger bigger budget kind of um, fairs and your directors guild and everything like that. Can you tell us anything about any any projects you're you're kind of running straight towards? Uh, well. We have a fantastic female-driven motorcycle movie about illegal motorcycle racing, which is absolutely off the charts and really exciting and big budget and, and, and brilliant cast that has been put together for that. Uh, and that's been packaged by major, a major agency, uh, which is really exciting. Uh, if that comes together, I'll be, in, I'll be in heaven for a year making that one because it's <laughs> all the things that I love. Uh, and then there's a, a picture in the South here, uh, a police procedural, which I... Was informed yesterday the financing has been closed on. Nice. That was very, very exciting. Great cast, great script, great uh, creative team, and I love, I love uh, filming in that part of America. As it, you know, in, I don't know what it is about the, the South. I just enjoy it, enjoy the history <laughs> there. And the food is terribly unhealthy, but it's, it, it, you know, alligator, fried alligator and stuff like that. So I just always enjoy it. Like I've filmed in Shreveport, Louisiana, New Orleans, and. Atlanta, and I, I, I like that part of the world to go visiting. It's, it's, you know, I'm a big Civil War buff and mm. military history buff, and I love exploring, you know, my head around it. It's also like a different country to, to California, <laughs> you know, and in many ways it is. In many ways, America is two countries, two coasts, and the center part, you know. Uh, I think, I think that's a sort of important thing to, to know when you, when you're from abroad and you, you come here. It's, you, you, you're going to have a very different answer. To every question you want in that part of the world compared yeah. to compared to California, so that would be fun. But some good stuff planned, you know. 
Thank That's you awesome. very much for all of these very, very in-depth questions. It's I'm, really I'm, good talking to you. I've tried to keep it nice and nice and light, uh, but um, honestly, this has been fantastic. When when I sent out the, the the message to see if you would be up for this, I'll be perfectly honest. I wasn't really expecting to hear back, um, but you're a British director, so it was it was imperative that I tried. And you've worked with Scott uh, Adkins. <laughs> you've uh, you've spoke to you've worked with Scott Adkins a lot. So it was again, it was imperative that I tried again because all your movies with that guy, I'm just totally in awe of. And again, I love working with him. He, he's he's a star. He's a star, and and it's a shame that yeah. it's not as yeah. as high. Any as other any be. other bloody period in history of filmmaking. Yeah, other definitely. than the twenty twenties. Any other period from the two thousands to the nineties to the eighties to the seventies, sixties, fifties, forties, thirties. Yeah, even the bloody twenties. And I've studied the thought nineteen twenties because I'm obsessed with, you know, the Ford <laughs> and the Hawk and the Rail Waters that came out of the twenties. He would have been a big, big. Are, and he yeah. probably still will be, and he should be. And do you see yourself returning to England to to make a film over here anytime soon? Or yes, yeah, we, we have a script that that uh, shoots in, in the UK. Awesome. Uh, I'll be shooting on the coast of Wales oh, and then nice. in London. It's it's a really interesting piece. I, they're out for some really big actors on that one, so I hope that goes. You just never, you never know until you're on set. I'm going to keep an eye out, and and again, I'm not apologising because uh, Green Street Two has a bit of a soft spot for me. Mark uh, <laughs> McCall is a dear friend. I met, I met him on that picture. We ended up doing beautiful ones together, which was my passion project. I met Deborah Del Pree, who was the producer on that picture, who's now my manager. I'm not heard of nice. uh, so I think it was the first or well, second picture I had Jonathan Hall shoot, and he now shoots all my films. So it was a you know, and, and you know, Luke Massey I met on that one. He's a dear friend. So strange, strange as it may sound, it it was the genesis of many friendships that would end up coming to be important in subsequent pictures. Yeah. You know? uh, as 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 films often are. You know. Ross Ross is another Brit actor that I wish I wish I saw more of. I wish I could see more of him. He's he's a fantastic actor. Yeah, it, he's a, such a such a a charming guy as well. You know. He's a very old school. If you get a chance, do, do a podcast with him. He's very, very smart, a writer and a producer and a director as well. I'll definitely be reaching out. Don't worry about that. <laughs> All right, take care. You have a great one. Thank you too. You too. I wonder how many people he's killed this week. Five. So far. I'm putting a team together, and I want you to lead it. Our target, Sean Teague. His intel and contacts alone are enough to bring down the baddest of the bad. I know what he did to you and your team, but we need Teague breathing. You want me to bring Teague in alive? Steady. Teague. As I live and breathe, John Gold. You're coming with me. Yeah, of course I am. This one is for I Am Vengeance Retaliation. Um... I recently got to speak to Ross Boyask, the the guy who made this film. It recently just came out. Um, if you if you get a chance to see it, it stars Stu Bennett. It stars Vinnie Jones, Jessica Jane Stafford, Joe Egan, um, Bentley Kalu, Sam Benjamin. So many, so many awesome people. Uh, Jean Paul Lee's in there. Phoebe Robinson, Galvin's in there. Written and directed by Ross Boyask. So yeah, I have seen this, so I'll be able to drop in little bits and pieces. This is what Phil had to say about the movie kind of starts off with a little bit of a blurb. So it hasn't taken long for writer-director Ross Byask to follow up 2018's Vengeance, aka I Am Vengeance, with the sequel. Probably because that film struck a massive chord with genre fans across the globe, respecting the action genre's vast and, may I say, beloved past. Whilst delivering a modern take on the traditional direct video action film, and of course featuring Stu Bennett in a compelling leading role. I'm guessing the fact that Bennett was on the UK screens as part of the World of Sport Wrestling, which I watched and was awesome, and had a huge name presence thanks to his former WWE career did not hurt either. However, Vengeance proved that Bennett was so much more. He is a bona fide action movie star, a commanding screen presence who isn't afraid to make fun of himself or the genre. The fine line Vengeance and now its sequel 
walk between hardcore action, serious drama and black comedy is what makes these films so much just sheer fun in the old, in the old school action movie sense. The kind of action movies you rented from your local video shop on artwork or name appeal alone and I'm really bloody enjoyed for the pure entertainment they provided. Like I said, Vengeance and now its sequel, I Am Vengeance Retaliation, reflect the genre's past whilst moving it forward. So yeah, um, I love that bit about the video, the, the video shop, because you did when you went into a video, oh man, I miss video shops, but you did, you kind of, you went in, you saw the box and you were like, holy shit, I know him, I know him, I'm, I'm getting that movie, that's gonna be an, an all out slobber knocker. So yeah, I totally get where Phil's coming from with that. And, and the movie does poke a little bit of fun with itself, especially Stu Bennett he knows what movie he's making and he's damn right gonna enjoy the movie he is doing did I mention this is a British production one that for all intents and purposes looks and feels like a US genre film it's a credit to the filmmaker Ross Boyask and his production team so then he kind of gets into a little blurb um, what the movie's about I Am Vengeance Retaliation sees former special forces soldier John Gold is given the opportunity to bring Sean Teague the man who betrayed his team on their final mission in Eastern Europe several years ago to justice. Gold would cheerfully see Teague dead, but he is convinced to, to help transport him to a military prison to pay for his crimes. Along the way, Gold will have to fight off Teague's team who are attempting to extract him as well as a sniper seemingly hell-bent on killing Teague before he can be secured. So you can see it's, it's not... It's not a massively overly original tale. I've kind of seen stuff like this before. Good guy um, doesn't want to bring the bad guy in. He'd rather kill him. But in an effort to take some some years off, uh, well, it's not years off his sentence. It's, it's in an effort to wipe his slate clean. He'll do what he has to do, which is bring in uh, Teague. Teague played by Vinnie Jones. And the movie kind of kicks off from there. It's, uh, it's sort of like um, he has to keep him alive. All these other guys are coming after him and then there's a couple of third parties and it is all a bit mental so whilst vengeance saw bennett star alongside the action movie legend that was gary daniels yes very much so this time around bennett has a more modern genre actor to co-star alongside vinnie jones a man who has made massive headway into the genre starring alongside some huge name action movie stars including Sylvester Stallone, Dolph Lundgren and Steven Seagal, managing to parlay his hard man football persona into a hard man acting persona. And here he is, he's a great foil for Stu Bennett. Whilst Bennett plays things a little tongue in cheek, Jones keeps things deadly serious, the two playing off each other perfectly. And I am going to jump in there because the, um, the chemistry between Stu Bennett and Vinnie Jones in this movie is absolutely fantastic the two of them like i don't know if, it, if it's the um the stu bennett kind of knowing what movie he's in very firmly having tongue in his cheek and just enjoying himself being the big action star but then you also kind of have vinnie jones who is going to be uh, is going to take it serious and i i've said on a, on a few different things this is the first time in a long time that i felt vinnie jones is I would never say phoning it in, like, um, I would never say that he's been phoning it in as of late, but I just kind of got the sense that he wasn't, he's not fully enjoying things, and in this movie, you can tell he is so enjoying himself, he is absolutely loving this film, being the, the straight man against Drew Bennett, sort of, you know, tongue-in-cheek guy. So as per the first film, Iron Vengeance Retaliation is packed with some amazing stunt work and fight scenes. The latter, no doubt due to the appearance of Jean-Paul Lee in the cast and Tim Mann in the credits. Tim Mann, we all know who Tim Mann is, a um, fantastic choreographer. Mann in particular is an unsung hero of many an action film. The Swedish stuntman and stunt fight choreographer has been behind a myriad myriad very nice full of action movies including the brilliant kill em all and scott adkins movies such as eliminators which featured bennett in a villainous role accident man and boyka undisputed four to name a few here man has obviously brought more martial arts action to the franchise with characters here preferring their fists and feet to firearms and on that um truly yeah a hundred percent um this is a cool like 83 minute movie uh, maybe 85 minutes so uh there is about 17 to 18 fight scenes in this and they're all different they're all they're all really good i mean some of them are going on at the same time and they're kind of intercut amongst each other so i mean take make of that what you will but there's there are a lot of fight sequences in this and tim man gets to flex his fighting chops all over this movie so that was a good thing as well i absolutely loved 
that. Kudos must also go to director Boyask and cinematographer Simon Rowling, who shot the fight in I Am Vengeance Retaliation at wide angles and with minimal cuts, allowing the action to play out on screen, showing just how well the fights have been choreographed and how well the cast, experienced or not, perform them too. Though special mention has to go to Phoebe, Phoebe Robinson Galvin and Katrina Durden, whose fight scenes against each other and against Bentley Kalu are some of the best in the movie and show that anything men can do, women can often do better. Yeah, 100% on that, by the way, because Katrina Durden, um, I, I know Phoebe from a couple of other movies. Um, I know what she's capable of. She is absolutely a force to be reckoned with and awesome. But Katrina Durden, for me, was just a massive, massive surprise because I hadn't seen her in anything else, if I'm completely honest. And she steals. She straight up steals almost every one of her scenes. She's so good in the movie. And her fight with Phoebe is excellent. But then when the two of them face off against him, um, Ben who is just just a man mountain just an amazing guy but when they face off against him it's just phenomenal just great scenes great screens so expanding on the revenge seeking anti-hero of the first film i am vengeance retaliation gives us a john gold who puts his life on the line for friend and foe alike in the pursuit of what's right for going the vengeance of the title somewhat to deliver a more traditional hero the kind of which chuck norris would be proud now there that right there is um yeah he wants to be proud of that chuck norris throw chuck norris in there so phil gives this movie five out of five from from for my own personal opinion i absolutely love the film i think the action is fantastic um i don't really have very little negative to say about it apart from the fact that and when i spoke to ross on um our un other interview he kind of he did mention that plot wise it's it's a little bit sort of threadbare um they like get the plot is there and it is what it is but i think that's maybe the reason i would knock it down a bit it does just seem to be fight after fight after fight which believe me if that's what you're going in for you've got a five out of five or a ten out of ten whatever markings you want to give it you have absolutely got that in this movie just for me personally i wanted to see a little bit more um, but everyone's fantastic in the movie. I got to see Phoebe again. I got to see Bentley again. I got to see Jean Paul again. I think uh, Stu Bennett and Vinnie Jones are wonderful together. Katrina Durden is a revelation. So I completely understand why Phil has gone with the five out, uh, five out of five rating. And that is awesome. And his last little tagline is uh, a worthy sequel to a damn fine original. I am Vengeance Retaliation is out in the US courtesy of Sarban Films, which is just amazing. The film is released in the UK on July 13th, so the movie's already out. Please do go check it out. Um, this is a fantastic film. I'm not. There's not really anything else I can I can add on top of um, what we've already gone through. I love I Am Vengeance Retaliation, and I want people to check it out. So please do. Ross Boy ask what a fantastic job he's done with this film. Yeah, so uh, we're going to move on to the next one and see what we've got. Arthur has abandoned us. Army is nothing without his father's guidance, the king's guidance. There is no king without Excalibur. Who's the fortunate lady? Queen Guinevere. But she is already wed to our king. <laughs> You will marry me, or I will kill you. My body is no more yours than the throne. What is my cause, Merlin? I fought a war, and the reason has been lost. What better reason than home? Today, we are to witness not just a union. Right, so this is where things are going to get super awkward because um, this is one of my contributions on the website, uh, nerdly.co.uk. I, I would be... Uh, it would be a bit silly of me if we didn't do this movie because he has a podcast. Uh, the director has a podcast. It is on Nerdly, and we love Giles. He is the director. Uh, he has his own podcast on there. So let's, uh, let's support his movie. Let's try and push his movie a little bit. Uh, the movie's called Arthur and Merlin, Knights of Camelot. This is the DVD review, and yeah, I wrote this, so please do bear with me. Uh, it stars Richard Short, Richard Brake, we all know Richard Brake, uh, the Night King from Game of Thrones, 
um, hundreds and hundreds of other films. Just such an amazing actor. Chris Johnson, who um, I'm a big fan of um, from Tom Payton movie uh, Black Sight, played Erebus. He's just wonderful. Joel Fillimore, who you will find I have a bit of an affection for in this movie. Tom Vellingham, Emily Haig, Joe Egan. Uh, oh, also from my I Am Vengeance. Written by Johnny Grant and Simon Cotton. Directed by Giles Alderson. I kind of went in on this one, so um, let's uh, let's just see where we go. We Brits are a fickle bunch. It has to be said when it comes to our TV shows and movies, there are certain genre, genres, tales or legends that we can never get enough of. Robin Hood for one. How many iterations do we need before we say, okay, that's quite enough? Numerous versions of the craze, but I guarantee right now there is a little Englander sat in his office writing the next craze movie. The story of King Arthur and Merlin is no different. Countless movies and highly successful TV show on our screens over the years, all putting their own unique slant on the law, trying to show us a different side of the legend, and here we sit with another Arthur and Merlin movie. Come on up, Arthur and Merlin, Knights of Camelot. It's your time. So then I get into a little bit about the uh, the blurb, and then we'll get into the, the movie itself. So England is a land divided, a country without its king, and a dark, tyrannical force looking to take control. After five years away while fighting a war abroad, King Arthur, played by Richard Short, and his battle-scarred knights are back home. He soon discovers that while gone, he had left his throne and his queen at the mercy of Modred, Joel Fillimore, his illegitimate son. It's time to take back his throne, his queen and his lands. However, he is about to come up against dark and dangerous threats from every angle. He must fight to save and preserve Camelot and all that he holds dear. Whilst, leaning more, whilst learning more and more about himself. Luckily, he has an ancient wizard mate, Merlin, played by Richard Brake, to guide him through his quest. Arthur must be the man his, this nation deserves in order to become the king that this nation needs as he embarks on a quest of self-discovery. Now, I like to write things as I speak to people, which is why I'm probably going to enjoy doing this podcast and especially reading this article. Um, but that little bit at the end, um, Richard Brake was actually in, um, he played Joe Chill in Batman Begins. So the little bit at the end about being the king the nation needs and deserves, that is a direct rip from um, the Dark Knight trilogy. I hope you caught that and I feel like an idiot for trying to explain it. So, as you can see, while we're treading a familiar tale, and I mean familiar in the sense that it is a King Arthur story and he has a bunch of badass knights. There is a wizard called Merlin, the Lady of the Lake and Excalibur. However, in this flick, we meet Arthur at a very interesting time of his life, questioning who he is and if he is even the person to be leading this country. War has not only ravaged his country and his men, but also his mind and soul, leaving him to contemplate what it was all about. Richard Short brings a great weathered and complex sort of old head performance to the role. There's a sense of real internal struggle as he makes his way back to his queen to face a foe all too close to home. At first, this was a performance that I just wasn't feeling and I had me wondering why this guy in this role. But as the story unfolds and you begin to see the scars of the battle, they've taken their toll, it becomes apparent what Short is doing here and I became a fan. Definitely, definitely. Um, Richard Short for me was a, a bit of a, I'm not going to say weird choice because he does have that sort of Kit Harrington kind of English gentleman sort of old head look and appeal, but it works. It, it definitely works. He, he's fantastic in the role. Um, I, yeah, there's not really much else I can say. He, he brings another level to it. So second build, Richard Brake as the titular Merlin is superb. Though he's not in the movie enough for me because I am of the opinion if you have Richard Brake, you bloody well use Richard Brake. I don't know if this is a budget thing and that they only had him for a short time, but it did make me think, why Arthur and Merlin then? And by that I mean, as, as if he's in it as little as he is, why call it Arthur and Merlin? Why not just call it Arthur and his Knights of Camelot or, or something like that? Having said that, Brake is superb in his limited time on screen. He delivers some grand dialogue as only he can and he absolutely makes an impression in the role. A quick side note, it was cool to see the man step out of his wheelhouse and give us something very, very different to what we are used to. He's, he's playing villains and here he is playing the ancient Merlin. So uh, 
No Arthur movie would be complete without his knights, and here we have a cracking cast of guys who all seem to slot into their roles beautifully, all bringing something very different to their respective roles. Tom Fellingham as Lancelot, close friend and advisor to Arthur, plays off Shaw with a, a decent chemistry and witty banter. Big shout out to Chris Johnson, mentioned it before, who I've raved about before for other performances, Black Saint. Johnson is absolutely an actor we should be all keeping an eye on and he brings the muscle of the crew as a jacked up bedivere just as menacing swinging his head at people as he is swinging a sword but there were also moments of heart for the character willing to lay all, lay all on the line for his king I've seen a lot behind the scenes photos of the knights out drinking and just playing around on set and their chemistry shows off big time on screen Joel Fillmore now this next bit's a little bit embarrassing. It is a little bit embarrassing. I wrote it having just watched the movie. My Don't get me wrong, my um, my opinion has not changed. Joel Fillimore is just just great in the film. But yeah, um, reading this back right now, it's a tad embarrassing. One thing we Brits love in our movies is a world-class shitbag. One thing we are Brit we Brits are great at playing in our movies is a world-class shitbag. Joel Fillmore is one such world-class shitbag as Modred, the son of Arthur and self-proclaimed king. This role could easily have gone to a big old joint of ham, but Fillmore strikes the exact balance of creepy pervert and whiny brat, often using a less is more approach to the scene that just oozed on screen. No spoilers here, but watch out for the scene when he just sits down on the throne for the first time to see how it fits. This is an actor who can say everything without saying anything right in that scene. Smashed it. Fillmore shares most of his screen time with Stella Stoker as Guinevere, and together the two were dynamite. Cheeky little mention for Emily Haig, who turns up as the Lady of the Lake and Why Not? The last is a cracking actress and rapidly making a name for herself. So yeah, Joel, um, Joel's fantastic. Wow, what a role he plays. Um, you can almost see the um, what I mean by the big old joint of ham um, and striking a, a balance of creepy pervert and whiny brat is that you can almost see him in between takes or just after a take twiddling his moustache you know he's, he's loving being a shitbag but sometimes that can go a little bit too far to the point where it gets super cheesy he doesn't get cheesy he, he just sort of skirts the borders very lightly and then um, he just plays the role fantastically I, I got a big old kick from Joel Fillmore so yeah he gets a he gets a big mention in the in the review so uh, this is kind of my final thoughts on the movie. So uh, Arthur and Merlin, Knights of Camelot, is not a perfect movie by any stretch. If there is one out there, show me. But director Giles Alderson, good friend, <laughs> has done a great job of bringing us a fresh take on the Arthur and Merlin tale. I love the use of natural lighting, whether that was budget or not, I don't know. Uh, this movie was shot in Wales, and it bloody well looks like Wales because it most likely rained every single day. But that's that's the country of Wales and it lends itself to the gritty dark aspect of the movie which is perfect the script has one or two moments of eh but any cracks are paved over with solid performances everyone involved should be proud of this flick and what they have accomplished and what I'm going to guess was a pretty tight budget making this a movie you should absolutely give your attention to will it be everyone's cup of tea? of course it won't but hey what is I look forward to checking out Alderson's future projects. Um, the Dare is, is one that I'm really, really looking forward to. It, it, it took him like four years to make it, and, and it's, it's only just coming out now. So yeah, I look forward to checking out Alderson's future projects. There's a very talented director here who has created a cracking fresh movie and a seat of Arthur and Merlin films, and one that, for my money, stands out on its own. As a lover of Brit movies, this flick, ticked all my boxes i totally recommend arthur and merlin knights of Camelot. it's a fun time knights throwing swords around or their heads looking at you chris johnson wizards delivering wizardy dialogue monologues classic brit shitbag villain fair maidens and camelot what more could you ask for so yeah arthur and merlin knights of Cam Camelot is out now it's on dvd and digital hd brought to us um from signature entertainment i really there's not much else i can say about that if you want to hear an interview i did with him go and see one of the other podcasts i absolutely uh 365 flex podcast i absolutely loved talking to giles and i had to touch on this one again for nerdly out loud because well he's on the he's on the website 
so why not? So this has been the inaugural episode of Nerdly Out Loud. I will be back, I will be back, and hopefully it'll be on its own feed. We'll be knocking that out of the park, and we will be going hammer and tongue on our own thing. Nerdly Out Loud is going to take off, and we're going to have some of the guys who are contributors, we're going to have some of the podcasters on, we're going to do all of that good stuff and just try and push Nerdly to the moon. In this episode, you have had a fantastic interview with Jesse Johnson, something you hadn't heard until today, but now you've got that. You've got this this amazing, amazing interview with the guy, talking about the films he loves making and his process and working with Scott Adkins and all that good stuff. Very, very honest, honest, honest interview. Uh, really enjoyed speaking to Jesse. He is just... He's been one of the highlights of, um, I, over the last five or six years podcast, and Jesse's been one of my highlights. You got like four fantastic reviews from the website. We'll be carrying that stuff on as well. You'll be getting bits and pieces, like um, I'll try and mix it up with games, um, board games, video games, TV shows. I'll be mixing it all up. And like I say, if I can get some of the guys from the website to jump on, Phil, you are on notice. You will be coming on this podcast to talk about your website because I want to know how Nerdly got started. I want to know where Nerdly came from. I want to know why you say that we are Nerdly, are you? Like, I, it's a bold statement and I need to know where it came from. So, Phil, you're on notice. You're coming on soon. But, yeah, I've absolutely enjoyed putting this together. Um, hopefully you love it too. Um, please do come back and have a listen when Nerdly Out Loud drops again. Listen to all the podcasts on the website. Please give the guys a shout out. Don't just follow the the, the Nerdly page. Follow everyone else. Um, we're a community. We're going to keep building, and we want to become even more awesome than we are, which is kind of why we thought, why not have a, a website podcast? Yeah, Nerdly Out Loud. Still love that name. Still love that name. Um, I'll be back, and I'll let you know when we're coming. My name has been Kevin Halden. I've absolutely loved this. Phil... We'll be back with an episode two. In the meantime, hit up all the social medias, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all of them. Hit them up, find Nerdly, like them, subscribe to them, give them reviews, whatnot, read the reviews, and uh, yeah, let's keep this truck rolling.